<sighs> I already know Bucks fans are going to hate me for this one as they rank 23rd heading into next season for this deep dive series. And that's not to say that this team has no shot at the playoffs. They definitely do. In fact, we're only nine episodes into this series, and we've already done now three teams in the NFC South. But that is a reminder of, let's face it, why this Bucks team did make the playoffs last year. They were 9-8 and eight inside what was by far the worst division in the NFL. But needless to say, a third of all of the playoff teams from the year before don't make it the next year. And uh, let's face it, I look at this Bucks team, the first uh, team ranked in this series that did make the playoffs last year, and say, you know, they have as good of a chance as anybody to be one of those teams that don't make it back. So that's why it's going to be really important that we talk about the guys that can elevate this team to being a playoff team again. And maybe more importantly, where some of those weaknesses and questions lie for this team that they're going to need to step up if they're going to get back. And that's what we're here for in this deep dive series. So please, please do hit that like button as we dive in. It really does help. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of these deep dives as we count down to the number one team in my power rankings. And certainly do not go anywhere because today we have a special, special guest, Trevor Sikama of PFF joining us back here for the Bucks deep dive this year. But let's go ahead and get started taking a look at this team's offseason changes. And with the coaching staff, this is going to be really one of the first question marks for this Bucks team is the loss of offensive coordinator Dave Canales, who we broke down for the now in division Carolina Panthers, a very nice addition for them. They are going to replace him with Liam Cohen, who we will talk about in the coaches segment here. But Canales was brilliant for this team last year. It's going to be very challenging for Cohen to be as good of a play caller. And then they are going to have a new special teams coordinator. Keith Armstrong is going to retire here. And they're going to go with Thomas McGahey, um is my best crack at pronouncing that name. Uh, but I am going to say downgraded with the coaching staff, really, until proven otherwise from Liam Cohen this year. But then no changes at quarterback staying neutral in that room as they retain Baker Mayfield. Slightly upgraded in the running back room, bringing in Bucky Irving in the fourth round out of Oregon. At tight end, really staying neutral there as well, losing nobody and adding Devin Culp out of Washington in the seventh round. Wide receiver, I did leave as neutral strictly for the fact that they're losing David Moore, who actually made some really big plays for this team in the final sort of third of the season. He was a midseason addition, only played 12% of the team's overall snaps, but was a piece for their offense down the stretch. They did make a better kind of future investment, though, in a guy in Jalen McMillan in the third round. As we'll see later, not quite sure how much he's going to play this year. Uh, and then they add Sterling Shepard for some veteran depth there. So going to say neutral with the wide receiver room. Where the offense might be better, however, is in the trenches on the offensive line, where they are saying goodbye to essentially their left guard between two players last year. Aaron Stinney played uh, 69% of their snaps at left guard was not particularly good. And then Matt Filer made up the rest of the 31% there. So both those guys out. And then they spend their first round pick on the interior of the offensive line in Graham Barton, maybe the best interior offensive lineman in this draft class. They also signed Ben Bredesen, who's probably a push with Aaron Stinney and some depth in Sua Opita and a sixth round pick in Elijah Klein. So the Graham Barton addition alone should be an upgrade for the offensive line. But other than that, it is, for the most part, the same exact pieces minus Dave Canales. And then as you look at the defensive side of the ball, they did have some very notable losses and didn't do a ton to replace them here. Interior defensive line is the exact same group. Uh, on the edge, Shaq Barrett is gone, and Shaq did actually get better as the year went on as he recovered from that ACL injury, so he is a loss, ended up playing two-thirds of their snaps. They do try to supplement that, bringing in Chris Braswell in the second round out of Alabama and signing Randy Gregory, but I do think that will be a downgrade from Shaq Barrett, who quietly put up 56 pressures, five sacks, and as usual, played really good run defense on the edge. Um, and then at linebacker, they lose Devin White, but 
man, that might even be addition by subtraction. He was getting benched by the end of the season. They're not worried about it. Eagles fans who signed Devin White won't like to hear this, but just losing him alone, we're going to say that's neutral, if not a slight upgrade. But to be fair, you do lose um, a major blitzing aspect of this team with Devin White. But then perhaps the biggest question mark for this roster will be, do they have the bodies to replace Carlton Davis as their other outside corner? They send him to Detroit. They're really counting on young players to step up there, but they did make some nice free agent signings that we'll talk about later in the video in Bryce Hall and Tavier Thomas. More of a slot piece there. But needless to say, it's it's a big body to replace and a, and a nice player to replace there in the cornerback room. So some questions added there. And then at safety, this is upgraded. They say goodbye to Ryan Neal, who played half of their snaps last year. But they bring in quite easily one of my favorite players in this draft class, Ty Key Smith and Jordan Whitehead. Probably should reverse that order because Whitehead is slated to start over Ty Key Smith. But uh, you get the point. Two really nice players getting put into that safety room. And then other than the special teams coordinator change, really no change on special teams. And that rounds out their off season. So, you know, it's uh, compared to the off seasons we've covered so far, I would say the Bucks had more downgrades and more question marks added relative to a lot of these teams. They're still um, not swimming in cap, cap space after, you know, coming off the heels of a couple years of pushing dead cap into the future to extend that Tom Brady era. Um, you know, their hands were tied up a, a little bit in terms of looking at what they did last year and making that push to get a lot better. There was only so much they could do. So I think that does lead to a little bit of the uh, lack of uh, call it hope that I have for this Bucks team this year being not the most exciting offseason here. But let's talk about this coaching staff, how these guys rank and stack up against the rest of the league and what this team is going to look like schematically on both sides of the ball. Starting with Todd Bowles running the show as the head coach, I think had a big redemption season last year. Had a lot to prove. What was this thing going to look like without Tom Brady? And it certainly wasn't all pretty in his first year with Tom Brady. So again, had a lot to prove and ended up being the team that kind of saw their way through the muck that was the NFC South. And this team did show tremendous improvements last season, all capped off by, you know, a, a really big statement win against the Eagles where Todd Bowles put on a defensive clinic in terms of how to blitz and attack an offense. So he definitely bought himself some runway, I think, last season, earned himself some credit. And uh, I currently have him ranked as the 15th best overall head coach in the NFL. Granted, we aren't ranking rookie head coaches this year, so something to keep in mind. But his ability as a defensive head coach is well reflected in their uh, defensive coaching rankings, where they are in the top five tied for first place in run defense coaching with an A-minus grade. And then for pass defense coaching, ranking in a little bit of a bigger cluster, a B-plus grade, ranking 7th to 18th, but very respectable rankings for how well this team is coached on the defensive side of the ball. And then also ranking very favorably as well for the overall coach and culture, sort of that benefit of the doubt slider for the team's culture that has been established here. They have a B-grade ranking 12th to 18th. I do think this team has a cohesive plan and is um, just overall, you know, plays hard and is inspired under Coach Bowles. Now, the downside to having a Todd Bowles is, as we'll see in a minute, they're going to have some question marks in terms of who's running the offense here. Anytime you have a defensive head coach, you're always going to run the risk of losing any good offensive coordinators you do find. So that is the downside to a Todd Bowles. We'll get there. But first, I want to talk about the scheme under Todd Bowles and what this team looks like defensively. And when I think of the attacking 3-4 defense that is aggressive and uses the uh, potential to drop edge rushers into coverage and blitz from any direction and blitz defensive backs and linebackers from a wide variety of different gaps and angles while also getting in your face and having well-coached, uh, you know, kind of fire zone rules so that 
you don't allow those, the, you know, quick access to the flat or an easy slant, or you know, you you trick a quarterback into thinking he's got a hot hot read in one direction, and then that's when the edge rusher or a linebacker that's showing a blitz in the B gap is dropping into that zone to pick you off or force the quarterback to second guess it. When I think of that type of system, Todd Bowles is probably the first name that comes to my mind, at least currently running that type of stuff in the NFL. You're always going to think of kind of Pittsburgh and Baltimore and what they've done for the last seemingly 20, 25 years being teams that do this stuff a lot too. But that's really the identity of Todd Bowles and his defense, at least in the past game. But what's also really nice about this Todd Bowles system is all of his run defense is baked into what he does in those blitz packages. They are very gap sound blitzes always. And if you can stay gap sound as a blitz heavy defense, um, you're going to get a lot of plays in the backfield as well. Cause obviously you have those guys, um, you know, playing fast, reacting and getting upfield quickly. And, you know, over the last four years since Todd Bowles got here, has there been a better run defense over that time in the league than the Tampa Bay Bucks? Um, I mean, they maybe have had a year here or, or a year there where they rank just outside the top 10, but um, this has really been consistently over time the hardest team to run on in the league. And yeah, having Vita Vea helps you do that, of course, um, but the scheme and the tenacity and effort that this team um, plays with under Todd Bowles is a big part of that as well. So that's why they get such respect for that run defense coaching, arguably the best run defense coaching in the league. So that's Todd Bowles, and he does, of course, have um, a pair of co-defensive coordinators, Casey Rogers and Larry Foote, that have been uh, under Todd Bowles now for a couple of years, but they are very much just an extension of Todd Bowles, of course. Um, but yeah, let's let's shift towards the offensive coordinator, really essentially the offensive head coach in this setup where Todd Bowles just doesn't have a lot of say on that side of the ball. They lose Dave Canales and are going to replace him with Liam Cohen, a young uh, sort of ascending mind in the league. He's bounced around a lot and has had mixed results. So he's 38 years old. And he has gone from, after coaching kind of uh, small school East Coast college teams for about eight years, Brown, Rhode Island, back to Brown, to UMass, then to Maine. After that stretch, he gets hired by Sean McVay as an assistant wide receivers coach. Uh, then he goes to work with the quarterbacks uh, in 2020. So that three-year stretch as an assistant coach for the Rams um, but then he goes to Kentucky in 2021 and had a lot of success with Will Levis. That is probably the crowning moment of Liam Cohen is getting Will Levis on the map, having that big uh, junior year for Levis at Kentucky. And then when he left, that offense went to shit, as we talked about when we broke down Will Levis as a prospect. Um, but then Liam Cohen gets hired as the offensive coordinator for Sean McVay on the Rams. And that was kind of the worst Rams team we've seen in the Sean McVay era. Not blaming Liam Cohen for that. That was mostly injury related, but needless to say, there wasn't a lot of success getting attributed to Liam Cohen for that year. So he goes back to Kentucky, but not as the head coach, as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach again, and again, mixed results. So I, I would just say he's very unproven outside of one good year with, uh, you know, an elite college quarterback. But this is very consistent with what they found in Dave Canales, right? Quarterback's background, Sean McVay, tree type of stuff. Very logical approach towards a guy that can run the same stuff that they ran last year from a schematic point of view. Come in and have familiarity with Baker Mayfield. He was with Baker in 2022 when the Rams signed him. So there's a connection there. This did just make sense. So there's no true reason to believe this can't work out. Um, but he is an unproven play caller at the NFL level. And that's why when you look at the rankings for this team, it's not going to be anything that blows you away. They come in ranked 25th to 27th in offensive pass game coaching, projecting a bit of a drop off from Dave Canales until proven otherwise. 
And then, frankly, when you want to talk about the run game coaching, uh, frankly, um, not only does Liam Cohen have a lot to prove there, but the Tampa Bay Bucks have a lot to prove. I mean, this has been like a deep-rooted issue that they haven't been able to fix going back to the Tom Brady era. This is something I'm really excited to ask Trevor about, is like, why can't this team run the ball? But this carries down, I think, to something bigger than the offensive coordinator is like why this team has struggled so much to run the ball. They rank tied for last for me in offensive run game coaching, 27th to 32nd with a C minus grade. So they're hoping that maybe Liam Cohen can look at some of those changes that Sean McVay made to his style of system with a lot more gap and duo type of stuff and uh, maybe see some gains with this Bucks run game this year. Something to keep an eye on for sure, but obviously a lot to prove for Liam Cohen, even if this was a sound hire, and I'm excited to see what he can do. And can he become the next guy in line from this McVay-Shanahan tree, uh, the kind of, you know, right around 40 years old, the ascending mind that runs this system? More often than not, these guys work out and turn into head coaches, right? So obviously a guy to keep an eye on in that regard. As far as the scheme is concerned, I, I think you can, based on what we've said, uh, understand that this is going to be a Shanahan-style, Sean McVay-style offense that if you're watching this series, you're probably pretty up-to-date on what this system looks like. It's a lot of wide zone play action used to set up deep shots on crossing routes and posts and all that stuff. The main idea to marry the run and the pass to make uh, pretty much everything you do look the same. It's a very sound system. There's a reason about two-thirds of the teams in the league run this, and there's a reason you probably have a pretty firm understanding of what this offense uh, and this playbook is is supposedly going to look like here. And it's pretty much the same playbook that the Bucks have from last year. Dave Canales came from the Sean McVay tree under Shane Waldron. So Bucks fans should have a pretty good understanding of what this offense should look like as well. But it is a very sound coaching staff, uh, assuming Liam Cohen can, can prove himself there, right? Next, we're going to dive into the roster. We're going to break down every position group, how they stack up against the rest of the league. But as we start talking about these players, and as we're approaching July here, training camp's coming up, if you're getting that itch for fantasy football, I know I certainly have. I just launched a couple Dynasty Leagues for our Patreon members. But I've also been scratching that itch at Underdog Fantasy, where with Best Ball, you can hop in, you can do your drafts, enter leagues right now. Best Ball is so fun, man. It is all about the draft, which is the best part of fantasy football. There's no trades. There's no waivers. There's no setting your lineups. They will just pick your best lineup every single week. And you're competing for the chance at legit payouts so if you feel like you've done your research and at this point uh, kind of ahead of the game before a lot of the you know big news and camp breakouts start to emerge if you think you know who those camp breakouts are going to be this is the time to get in and do your best ball drafts so you can get those sleepers two or three rounds later than you might be able to get them a month from now and that's where a lot of the big winners come for best ball so Right now, take out your phone. You can draft at Underdog Fantasy. Scan that QR code on the screen or sign up using promo code TFG, and you will support my channel and this series in a big, big way. You can also participate in Pick'ems for MLB. They have season-long Pick'ems as well for NFL players over at Underdog. So, again, that's promo code TFG at Underdog Fantasy. And let's get back to the Bucks where we are going to start by talking about the quarterback room, bringing Baker Mayfield back on that sort of uh, new tier of quarterback contracts that seemingly didn't exist for a few years there, but now we've seen kind of the Daniel Jones, Geno Smith, Baker Mayfield contract where, you know, it's a one-and-a-half-year contract where the first year is a lot of guarantees. Year two, it's like, yeah, you're probably going to be our quarterback, but if we want to get out of it, we can. And then the third year is essentially a team option where they can definitely get out of it if they want, but if you're playing well, it's a good value for the team, and they can keep them around. And that's kind of the exact type of contract they should have given Baker Mayfield because he really, I, th I think, reestablished himself as a solid 
capable starting quarterback in the NFL. There are a good bit of things to like with Baker Mayfield. I think from a kind of commanding the offense point of view, he's very good. Like the leadership is great. The buy-in with the locker room was really there from the get-go, working with these guys in camp, trying to get up to speed with this offense, um, and really earning this job, earning the trust of the locker room. That's there. The command at the line of scrimmage to, you know, um, orchestrate things at the line, notice blitzes, make his checks. It's, I'm not going to say he's Dak Prescott and he's Joe Burrow, but it's it's very good. It's a well above average by NFL standards. And then just the overall processing and decision-making. Again, it's not perfect. That's where a lot of his inconsistencies can come from. But it's certainly good enough in terms of playing on time, getting through progressions. He's always had that um, ability to snap his head around, get through his progressions quickly. And then overall, like not make mistakes as well, which is what, what was a big part of what was different last year was avoiding those negative plays. And that didn't just mean not throwing the ball to the defense, avoiding interceptions, but most importantly, where Baker uh, had to improve and did improve within this Bucks offense last year was not taking so many sacks and in turn fumbling and turning the ball over that way. But he did a variety of things to get better in that department. Number one, just playing faster, playing on time, um, playing within the structure of the offense to reduce his time to throw and get the ball out quicker. He had the lowest time to throw since his rookie year, which was one of the best years of his career, but also not forcing bad throws when they aren't there, taking the check down when he needs to. And just in general, again, avoiding those negative plays was the first thing you really started to feel as the season went on for Baker Mayfield. And I think as long as he can keep up with that, you're going to stick with this, you know, solid, capable starter that can return dividends on that contract. On top of what we've talked about, you've got um, a guy with a really good arm that can push the ball downfield, make those big-time throws that you're looking for from your quarterback, create those explosive plays. He can very much do that for you. He's very good off of play action as well um, to help make those things happen. I think we have seen, however, a a drop in arm talent a little bit. Um, It's not a severe drop-off, but prior to that really bad shoulder injury that Cleveland basically made him play through that led him kind of out of town in Cleveland. Um, Prior to that, he kind of had an underrated cannon. Now it's a very above average arm, but I do think we've seen a little bit of dip in that true, uh, frankly, man, I hate to use the word elite, but great arm talent that he had. I think he has good arm talent now, if that makes sense. And I, I think as well, the accuracy has taken a slight dip down, When you start to talk about some of the inconsistency with Baker Mayfield, where he can seemingly go three games straight and he looks awesome, and then the fourth week, it just isn't quite all there. Sometimes that can be an accuracy issue where he he can spray throws, but even to the point where there are those like slightly inaccurate throws where he's not always leading his receiver or the throws at a guy's hip pocket where he was just off on a deep ball. It's not, I'm not saying he has bad accuracy, but relative to like the most accurate quarterbacks in the league, um, I think early in his career, you felt like he could have been that. I don't know that he has the true command of the ball like he once did, and he's working through that. Perhaps that can get better as he adjusts to kind of who he is and what he can get away with with his arm now. Maybe something to keep an eye on there, but I do think that kind of plays into who he is, a little bit of the inconsistency, this idea that You know, is he the forever quarterback for the Bucs? Probably not. Do the Bucs think he's their forever quarterback? Probably not. But he's a capable answer right now, and it's awesome that they kind of stumbled into him after giving him a one-year, $4 million contract last year. And he's kind of turned into the perfect guy to bridge them out of this, you know, Tom Brady era, which they're still very much a part of right it's it's the same defensive coach it's a lot of the dead cap a lot of the veteran players they're still very much yes they made the playoffs last year but we saw their offseason it wasn't like they were going for broke with with baker mayfield and this regime they're still very much concerned and and at least considering 
what the 2026 Tampa Bay Bucks might look like. And I think Baker Mayfield is a, is a perfect quarterback to get them where they need to go in time. Granted, there is a potential downside to this where if you're, if you're too good, you walk yourself into purgatory. So they, they're going to have to kind of keep an eye out for that opportunity um, for the quarterback of the future whenever that might you know, present itself, be it a trade up or be it a, a good quarterback prospect falls to you thinking like, you know, Jordan Love, Green Bay, um, how they played that, you know, those opportunities can present themselves. But I think it will be um, I, I, I'll just say it. I think it would be a mistake from this point forward. If the if the opportunity to go get that guy presents itself, I think it would be a mistake not to pounce on it and start that clock. Um, but as far as this most recent offseason was concerned, I think bringing Baker Mayfield back and trying to kind of um, solidify the base of this team makes makes sense. So overall, he's a very solid quarterback. He's the type of quarterback that will allow this team to do what they want to do offensively, not necessarily elevate what they want to do too much, um, and, and certainly not a quarterback that's going to like put the team on his back and win you a Super Bowl. Maybe a guy in a perfect situation that that could go to the dance and um, you know, go on a run or whatever. But I, at the end of the day, I've got him ranked as the 20th passing quarterback in the NFL, 21st overall quarterback, because you're not really getting um, anything from him as a rushing threat, whereas some other guys might get elevated because of that in the design run game. But let's move on to the backup room. Y you got Kyle Trask. Um, still kind of crazy to think that this team spent a second round pick on him. I think the thinking at the time was they were all in on that team and he was more of a high floor backup kind of, you know, the Nick Foles comp from me, I think still carries weight if they ever had to lean on Kyle Trask to this point in time, though, they haven't had to. Their quarterbacks have been healthy. He got beat out by ba Baker Mayfield. That wasn't a huge surprise, though. This was a QB competition around this time last year. But, uh, yeah, I mean, in theory, he should be one of the better backup quarterbacks in the league. A guy that's going to take his risks from the pocket, give his wide receivers a chance, but uh, just hasn't really gotten that opportun opportunity to show us that, that he is that high-end backup. And for the Bucks' sake, you're hoping that that doesn't change. Um, and then they do bring in John Walford, who Liam Cohen has experience with in L.A. But... Uh, yeah, there's your quarterback room. Let's go ahead and talk about the weapons next, which is a really good room here. They get a very good B grade for me for the weapons, ranking 13th to 18th in the league. And that starts with Mike Evans uh, carrying a lot of the load here, heading into his age 31-year-old season, coming off of one of the better years of his career. And I think it's pretty safe to say that he has a play style that doesn't really depend on foot speed and speed change of direction to the point that I'm less worried about him at 31 years old than you might be for some other guys, especially coming off the year he had last year. But he is really the poster boy for the X wide receiver in the NFL. The guy you look at and say, yeah, that is a perimeter ball winner an outside dominator at the position. Maybe not the most diverse route tree, but within the right role, He's perfect. He runs goes, he runs posts, he runs digs, he runs comebackers, and he runs slants. A very linear route tree, but a necessary one for really any offense. And I've been hard on Mike Evans in years past for what I've described as a lack of overall separation. Um, but I'll just be honest, like he impressed me in that department last year. There's there's still some matchups where, you know, Marshawn Lattimore can stay in his hip pocket throughout the route and, you know, he can he can disappear in certain weeks. But I'm certainly not going to sit here after the tape we saw last year and continue to tell you that Mike Evans can't separate. He stacks wide uh, he stacks corners on the outside. His his speed is is interesting because it's build up speed in a lot of ways. In those short areas, that's where you see a more lumbering, stiffer wide receiver. But if he's running a go ball and he gets a good release off the line of scrimmage, and corners have a hard time, you know, keeping a hand on him to slow him down, he continues to pull away and he absolutely separates deep. But he also creates separation 
um, with a lot of subtle nuances in his routes that I probably haven't given him credit for in years past. The way he can stop on a dime on a comeback or, or a hitch route, the way he can attack the middle of the field on a hitch route and fire off the ball on a slant as well. There is separation there. I, I just would circle back to like on certain routes and certain, um, you know, scheme opportunities. And then beyond that, the only thing I really have to say about Mike Evans, I, I just wish he didn't drop the ball quite as much. And a lot of these drops are coming on like high leverage moments where he is getting open and he's getting these accurate throws like right into his bread basket. And it's like, oh, Mike, that's a backbreaker. I mean, he had the he had a drop in the uh, Eagles game that would have been a touchdown. He had a drop in the um, the Lions game that turned into an interception over the middle of the field early in the game was a huge difference in that game. Granted, he turned it around and had a great game. Other than that, it wouldn't have been close without him. There was a, a drop, I recall, with Tom Brady uh, where he torched, I think it was against the Panthers, just right there for like a 65-yard touchdown. It's like, oh, man, Mike uh, could have even more without some of these drops. But needless to say, he is the best wide receiver here. He is the best X, like true X wide receiver in the NFL. And I'm not expecting a slowdown here at 31 years old after what we saw last year. In fact, if anybody deserves a down arrow, it might be Chris Godwin. I'm not bold enough to put the down arrow on him because I love Chris Godwin, but I certainly wouldn't describe him as a dominant number two wide receiver at this point. He's a very, very good one and a true stud. And I'm not trying to sound overly negative here, but this isn't Jalen Waddle. This isn't Devonta Smith. Surely what Debo is for the 49ers or what Tyler Lockett has been for the Seahawks for years. If you catch my drift, he is a better wide receiver too than most teams have. But there's probably seven to ten teams in the league that have a better wide receiver too than Chris Godwin. Who is a very stable force he is a great compliment to Mike Evans because he is at his best in the short to intermediate game, specifically the intermediate game. But as a run after catch threat, he's still really good. He's built like a running back. And there's a reason they love throwing him bubble screens, tunnel screens, RPOs, getting the ball in his hands quickly. But the fact of the matter is he just hasn't been that explosive of a wide receiver for several years now he hasn't shown that deep separation was just three for 16 on deep targets last year he was 36th in the nfl in yards after the catch last year 36th in yards per route run last year yes he ultimately put up a thousand yards as the number two wide receiver on the team that was fifth in passing attempts and he was 15th in targets in the entire nfl and I, I hate sounding negative here because, again, he's a very good wide receiver, too. But I have just been left a little disappointed in what Chris Godwin has been for this team for several years now. And I thought with this new scheme coming in, he was kind of kind of uh, going to kind of take a leap in sort of that Cooper Cup role. It, it just wasn't dynamic. So he's a really good, reliable number two wide receiver. He's a big reason why this team is still... Um, ranking very favorably in terms of weaponry. But I do still think a couple of Bucks fans might look at this duo and be like, how is that not top 10 weapons in the NFL? And uh, I think some of that is what we described with Chris Godwin. And then I think some of that is um, the lack of players after those two, or at least the lack of established talent after those two. Because I am, for what it's worth, very, very fascinated uh, by Trey Palmer for what we saw last year. A sixth-round pick out of Nebraska by way of LSU. And some dudes are fast, and some dudes can just blaze. And with Trey Palmer, I, I would pretty safely say, of all the film I've watched prepping for this series to this point, he's the fastest player I've watched on film. Well, that's not true. I have watched a Dolphins game. So um, other than that, uh, Trey Palmer has 
legit game 4-3 speed. Some dudes run 4-3 and it just doesn't show on film. Trey Palmer, it's like, wow, this dude is burning by dudes. He destroys pursuit angles. He has legit speed for this offense. And that's something that they don't have in Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. So if you want to talk about complementary skill sets, it's absolutely there. And they don't need him to turn into this dynamic route runner that can beat you in a a bunch of different areas. They just need him to do uh, what he can do as a deep threat. And I actually am kind of optimistic that he could take another jump this year. Uh, the, the main thing with him is if he's just going to be that deep threat within this offense where all the other players can take care of the short to intermediate and all the other routes. Um, the main thing for him, if he's just going to be that quote unquote MVS is for him to not be MVS and to not have random drop issues and bad ball skills. He doesn't have great size. He's probably never going to be a great contested catch ball winner. Um, but even when he's open, He just needs to have more reliable hands. He did have three drops last season, um, but had a fourth drop that was ruled a fumble eventually where he was reaching out, but then kind of never fully had it, fell over himself. Um, He got the catch, he got the yards, but then they lost control of the football. So that was an interesting play. But that's really going to be the main question for him as a deep threat is can he consistently catch the ball? when he's open deep beyond that it's just going to be like is he ever really going to be a guy that does other stuff for you you know i'm not going to say he can't run routes but he is a more slender player he struggles with contact down the field he's not someone that's going to win a lot of tough catches in those shorter areas so nobody is or should act like trey palmer is this incredible prospect and great player but If you're looking for a piece that is missing within these five starters as someone that can truly just take the top off the defense and, um, you know, open everything up underneath for everybody else, I think he can be a very useful player for the Bucs this season in that department, as he was in a lot of games last year. So he did impress me. And for a sixth round pick last year, that's a that's a great find. But sticking with the wide receiver room, that is why they took Jalen McMillan in the third round is I think they project Trey Palmer, as we described, someone that's probably never going to take that leap to be a number one or a number two guy, probably going to fill that role as the number three in a deep threat. And Jalen McMillan is someone that very much has Chris Godwin's skill set. Slants, crossing routes, run after catch, short to intermediate game. He was awesome at that in Washington and really good on those deep crossers that any sort of uh, Shanahan style system is going to scheme up a lot of those looks for uh, a guy like Godwin or a Jalen McMillan here. So I I don't know how much he's going to play this year. I do think he'll get his rotation in and and split reps with Trey Palmer, depending what sort of concepts they kind of, they want to run because if they do want their number three running a dig, Jalen McMillan's going to be much better at that. Or if they want to put Godwin and Evans outside and have a guy run a more diverse route tree or beat press from the slot, that that could be more Jalen McMillan than Trey Palmer. But I do think long-term, McMillan has a chance, just like Godwin as a third-round pick, to emerge as a capable player. I liked Godwin a lot more in the third round and, and thought he should have gone a lot earlier, whereas McMillan in the third round made sense to me. But then you have Sterling Shepard. You know, to me, that's just depth. That's what he should be at this point, because if he's ever asked to start, he breaks down. But if you need a week as a starter because one guy's unavailable or you need a guy to just give you um, 8 to 12 good reps a week, like, find enough signing for that. And then I'd expect Rakeem Jarrett uh, to make this team as their sixth wide receiver. Talented player out of Maryland that I definitely should have gotten, uh, definitely think should have gotten drafted but still very much kind of learning the ins and outs of the position. Beyond that, I look at this uh, group and say, yeah, they're probably keeping six wide receivers. Then you look at the tight end room. It's one of the worst tight end rooms in the league, though Kate Otten came on late last season and did exactly kind of what he projected to do in the league. And there's very, very little reason to believe that he can't be that capable possession tight end for this team he's not a sensational athlete he's not going to create a ton of separation he's not the biggest guy and the strongest guy to be this 
dominant run after catch threat or even this dominant contested catch ball winner but if you're looking for your to steal a term from the kids that npc possession tight end your austin hooper or what my pro comp on k dotten was your cam Brait, someone the bucks fans are obviously familiar with that's why i was a fan of the bucks taking k dotten he can absolutely be that guy reliable underneath trust target for baker mayfield behind him you have a blocking specialist in co keeft and Payne durham who is essentially an even less athletic version of k dotten with potentially better ball skills i liked Payne durham as an insurance pick if k dotten hadn't worked out but it does look like k dotten is going to hit as a sort of um midline starting possession tight end now they did draft Devin Culp in the seventh round. I think that was a very specifically pinpointed uh, pick to get that guy for those 12 personnel play action looks to create some explosive plays. Um, having a guy with a little bit more speed that can get lost on crossing routes and run wide leak or you know give him a handoff on a jet sweep, just kind of a little bit more juice at the tight end position that they just don't have in that room made sense so we might see a good game or two from Devin Culp in that role but it's never going to be anything consistent or someone that's going to emerge as a starter for this team but while it's one of the lower ranking tight end rooms you do have one of the best receiving backs in the NFL in Rashad White he is one of the more polarizing backs in the league in terms of being one of the best receiving backs in the league and being one of the worst runners among starters in the league I will always call back and give credit to our guy, Mike Renner, who called his shot after the senior bowl and said, I think Rashad White should just be a wide receiver. And I still kind of agree with that. He has such smooth hands. He runs good routes. He's dynamic after the catch. He's so good at making guys miss on screens. And when they flip the ball to him in the flat, he was third in the NFL in receiving yards, third in the NFL in missed tackles forced on receptions and fourth in the NFL in overall receptions. So I'm not going to say this is Christian McCaffrey or prime Elvin Kamara or anything like that, but he is quite clearly one of the best receiving backs in the NFL. And then they got depth in terms of receiving backs too. They draft Bucky Irving. When they first drafted Bucky Irving, I was like, isn't this a little redundant with Rashad White? But number one, White's in a contract year. But the other thing, I want, I want to shout out our guy Josh Kuipo over at Pewter Report, who pointed out that the Bucks want more of a this-is-your-drive, this-is-your-drive split as opposed to a rotational split. And I think they like the convenience of you're going to take this drive off Rashad White, we'll put in Bucky Irving and not miss a beat. And for that role, I, I really like that. I think he can give you a lot of the same stuff that White does in terms of that shiftiness out in space. One of my favorite things Bucky Irving had on tape was just his juke move, his ability to make guys miss uh, kind of outside the tackle box. So it should be a good impact as a rookie. And then even Chase Edmonds does some good stuff in the receiving game as well. Irving's going to have to prove that he can beat him out, but I think he will. But that rounds out this entire group of weapons. It's well-crafted. It is one of the biggest assets that this team has overall. It's a big reason for this team's success last year. Again, ranking 13th to 18th in the NFL for overall weapons. But I'm not so kind to the running backs, um, specifically as runners of the football. I am just and have always really just been brutally underwhelmed by Rashad White as a runner of the football. Now, a lot of people will come out and say, well, well, he had 1,117 rushing yards last year. He was seventh in the NFL in yards. How can you... Rank them as low as you do. I've got them tied for worst in the NFL for running back. So I'm real low to the point that I don't even put Rashad White in the good starter tier. I have him as an adequate starter. To me, that production is strictly based on the volume. Yes, he had 1,100 yards, but he was second in the NFL in attempts behind Christian McCaffrey. 299 attempts, which he was one of four running backs that had over 275 attempts this season. But in yards per attempt, 
he was 46th, also 46th in yards after contact. Even in Miss Tackles Forest, which is like his game, right? His jump cut, his juke move is his defining trait. He was still 17th, despite being second in attempts. So to me, he is missing a lot as a runner, and it starts with his vision. He puts himself in a lot of compromising situations, not just bouncing runs outside more than he should, but lacking the ability to identify a hole and burst into it quickly before that space closes. He's like the equivalent of a quarterback that needs to see a wide receiver open before he throws it. He's the equivalent of that at running back. And probably the the prime example of why vision does matter at the running back position to an extent at least where you can't have some of the worst vision among starters in the NFL if not the worst vision outside of maybe DeAndre Swift um that's what's missing for Rashad White and that's where it all comes back to like man could you just turn this guy into Debo Samuel could you pull a reverse um uh, quarter L Patterson with this guy he might be awesome But they just refuse to stop giving this guy the ball. And so often, he is just going nowhere. So he is their starter. And, um, you know, he he will, from time to time, pick the right hole. He will get well-blocked runs. He'll get out in space and do some stuff. Uh, but uh, man, it's it's just not as pretty as the total rushing yards would tell you. And he's heading into a contract year. I am very fascinated to see how they play this because as we broke down, he's phenomenal in the receiving game. But how much does that matter when you're uh, quite possibly the least efficient running back in the league? Now, I, I do want to at least point out that their run blocking was miserable last year, and they're hoping that will be better this year. And maybe some of that efficiency can go up if you're giving him clearer and more holes to hit. But... If they don't extend him, they just drafted Bucky Irving, who is a very fascinating player. 5'9", 195 pounds. This dude is tiny. And he also doesn't have particularly great long speed. But what he does have is that human joystick electric juke move out in space. And he has... I would say much more instincts and field vision than a guy like Rashad White to kind of sense guys coming from the second level, you know, making a guy miss using a move, but also in an attempt to set up the next move. Like he has incredible awareness in that regard. And and it's tough because he has really good vision on certain run concepts, and certainly when he gets out in space. So I can't say he has bad vision, but there are a lot of runs where he knows his best ability is out in space, and he does bounce things outside. He wants to get out on the perimeter and do what he does well. And not only is that just not ideal in terms of being a consistent between the tackles runner, but for a guy that has four, five, six speed, is he going to find out that he can't get away with that as much as he did at the college level in the Pac-10? So I do struggle with Bucky Irving. I, I like him a lot. A lot of people have drawn comparisons to Kyron Williams. And in terms of size and athletic ability, I understand that. I just think Kyron showed much better between the tackles vision at Notre Dame. And I don't know that Bucky Irving is going to have that same ability that Ky- Ky- uh, Kyron Williams has to consistently get you four or five yards with with good between the tackles running that's what's really going to be to be determined but I, I do think he can be a threat to Rashad White who was a fourth round pick in his own right and can at least be a, a, a bridge running back we're making all these quarterback parallels with this running back room it's fascinating but uh what was a was a fun nice pick and if the plan is like we described in the in the receiving breakdown, um, you know, Rashad gets three drives and then Bucky gets one. I think these are relatively similar skill sets where you can basically just do the same stuff and not really have to worry about which back is out there. I think you could apply that same logic to Chase Edmonds, who's been around um, a couple teams now and has been a, a solid player. Nothing special, but solid. But then after that, I, I 
I'm going to continue to put the eyeballs on Sean Tucker and say this is someone you got to at least keep an eye on, put on your watch list in your dynasty leagues, that sort of thing, um, because he's got talent. I was lower on him than some, which is saying something that I'm still saying you got to keep eyes on him. But a lot of people thought this was like a you know a potential third round pick, a guy that could be a starter in the NFL out of Syracuse, a very complete back in terms of size and skill set. But there does seem to be just something missing there, and I hate to speculate on what it might be, but he goes undrafted. There was plenty of reason for him to get an opportunity last year. It just didn't come. Really hard to say why this sort of fall off for him has happened, but clearly something behind closed doors is holding him back. But if if he can break through, I still think I look at this room with a bunch of either undersized or receiving specialist at running back and say that's the dude that could be more of a three down player in a more efficient way for this team so you don't count on that but but certainly it's in the realm of possibilities so there's your running back room they rank to me as i said tied for last a c minus grade 31st to 32nd and I'm not exactly optimistic that this run game is going to blow up this year with this group. Um, you also are getting no multiplier from the quarterback. They ran two designed runs for Baker Mayfield last year, and it's not like he's some dynamic rushing threat. He can get you six yards or whatever on a on a well-schemed read option if, if there's no one there to hit him. But um, nothing that's uh, tapped into enough to boost the run game. So they are tied for last in terms of QB run multiplier. But our last position group for the offense is the O-line, and they, I think, are hoping, at least from a run-blocking perspective, that this will be better, as it was one of the worst groups last year. And then they're obviously hoping that the pass protection will again be pretty good, as it was last year. So let's just go from left to right. You have Tristan Wirfs at left tackle, who was... So, so good switching over to left. I just really want to give him credit. I mean, I came out here on last year's deep dive and I basically said, I I think he's going to do it, but I raised the question of like, is that right side to left side going to be a seamless transition for him? I was like, you know, he was at right tackle at Iowa. Was he at right tackle for a reason? What's that transition going to look like? Stupid me. I mean, he was just as good, if not even better, at left tackle. And his pass protection, it's just so... Maybe this is lazy. I feel like it's lazy anytime I use the word consistency. But that's what it came down to for him. It it was just the same thing over and over and over again. He is a moving brick wall in pass protection. He's so hard to beat because... Yeah, he's got the size. He's 345 pounds or whatever he feels like playing at that week, depending how many Chipotle burritos he had uh, the day before, I guess. His play strength is unbelievable. That's never been a question for Tristan Wirfs. But he takes it a step further than some of these other guys that are, are, are really good pass protectors at his size, guys like Trent Brown, Orlando Brown. He takes it a step further because he has a step up in athleticism. He gets better depth in his kick slides. And in specific, in particular, he's got quick enough feet to cut off inside counters. You pair that with the length and and plenty of good technique. It's like, how do you truly beat Tristan Wirfs? You kind of got to just get lucky in confusing him with finesse. So I give him an elite grade as a pass protector. And the scary thing is he might just be getting better. 25 years old. If I said the only way to, con- to beat him is confusing him with finesse or on a stunt, that processing can only get better for him. You also got to give him credit for his durability. I mean, in a league where a lot of the top tackles in the league have been getting hurt, he doesn't. And I I think the fact that he is so big boned and guys are never really like putting a beating on him probably plays into that. So you love everything you could possibly say about him in pass protection. And then as a run blocker, I wouldn't say he's elite. I would even go as far as saying that at times his athleticism can be overrated as a run blocker. And I hate to say that, but he had this incredible workout at the combine and people were saying he's the Saquon Barkley of O-linemen. When I watch his tape, I, I don't think you see 
you know, you don't see Trent Williams. You don't see really a, a long list of tackles that I would say are more athletic than him. I, I think relative to his size at 345 pounds, as we described, he moves very well. But in terms of get off or getting to the second level as consistently as the elite run blockers in the league, there is still a bit of a trade off when you're talking about a guy that can play at 350 pounds, right? So that acceleration and speed to the block is a big part of the run game. And I, I, I know I'm, you know, an outlier to say that, but I think the film shows that he's just, he's a little bit slower in the run game. Not that he's anything close to bad. He's really good at it. Clearly when he sticks his hands on you, he can drive you backwards. He's smart in that phase. Still very much, I would say, in the top 10 or so in overall run blocking for tackles. I just had a couple notes there relative to how people talk about him. But um, he's he's unbelievable, man. And he is probably, uh, I'll give him another week until he becomes the highest paid tackle in the NFL. Because Andrew Thomas from his draft class has been paid. Penny Sewell, who was drafted a year later, has been paid. He has given them top three tackle play for four years on a rookie contract. He shouldn't step foot on a blade of turf. He shouldn't leave his couch until the Bucks give this guy a four-year, $114 million contract with 70 in guarantees. Wouldn't be surprised if that gets announced before this video is even released. But you do have question marks beyond that really at every other spot other than right tackle. So let's just talk about Luke Gedeke, and then we'll get into more of the question marks with the O-line, which, by the way, I should have led with this. They rank pretty much smack dab in the middle of the league for O-line, so it is it is a good group. I've got them ranked with a B-minus grade, 15th to 16th in that massive cluster that's hard to uh, differentiate, ranking 5th to 19th in pass blocking, again, a B-minus grade, and then 18th in run blocking, so hopefully better than last year with a B-minus grade. But back to Luke Gedeke, he broke out last year. There were major questions heading into the year of what he was going to be for them. They drafted him in the second round as a tackle out of Central Michigan, but to play guard. And he has been, in a lot of my conversations with the draft and other players, he's become a poster boy for, like, you know, basically stop saying these undersized tackles need to play guard because it if anything you need more play strength to play guard and they take a lot of these guys and say oh he has 32 and three quarter inch arms he needs to slide inside he doesn't he doesn't have the length to play outside but it turns out no if if he's gonna play a little bit lighter but he's a great athlete and he's got really good feet he should be at tackle and then you can find out if the arm length is a problem so that's exactly what happened. They switched him back to tackle, and he was awesome. He was probably somewhere from the 10th to 15th best right tackle in the league last year. He was a huge part of this team surprising because as we, if we look back at this offensive line last year, it was like, man, this could be a disaster. If Luke Gutticke is bad, it went in the other direction. He was actually quite good, and I don't think that's going to change. He had really good technique at Central Michigan. He's Like we said, he was a really good athlete. He's a really good run blocker. He has all of the tenacity and effort you look for as a blocker. He seems to enjoy what he does. How often do we talk about offensive linemen? Like at the end of the day, if you're going to play 65 snaps, smashing your head into 300 pound dudes, you got to enjoy hitting them and the violence that's required to play this. And I think he does. You do see him lose specifically in pass protection with his anchor he is a little bit undersized, as we said. He does have shorter arms, so guys can get his into his chest and push him back. It's something I think you're probably always going to live with a little bit on him, but he is only heading into year three. Has plenty of um, room still, though, to you know kind of bulk up and, and handle that a little bit better. Very good player. He himself um, heading towards a payday of his own, but probably a year removed from that. So... Having a cornerstone tackle duo is a big deal and a big reason why this offensive line ranks out pretty well as we just broke down. But as we also mentioned, you've got questions on the inside. I do want to start with Graham Barton because he he's really only a question because he's a rookie. And if John Michael Schmitz didn't just have the bad year that he had for the Giants, I wouldn't even stop to question if Graham Barton is going to be great. But it was a reminder that even the 
seemingly safest prospects sometimes surprise you and aren't as good as you think. So he's got to come out and prove it. But God, I just loved Graham Barton. And the main question with him is kicking from tackle to center. How does that transition go for him? How does he handle the snapping element? He ha- He played center four years ago at Duke. So it's not like he's never done it before. But even if I raised questions um, and pointed out that there's no guarantee with any of these rookies, if I had to bet on the maybe five to ten rookies in this draft that are going to be studs in their rookie year, I think Graham Barton would probably be, make that list. It's just so hard to believe with all of the boxes he checked as a prospect that he's not going to be a franchise center for the box. Athleticism checked. Um, toughness, dickhead mentality as a run blocker, checked. Technique as a pass blocker, checked. Play strength, check. Smart dude, check. Year-to-year growth, development, trajectory, check. I mean, seriously, this guy was awesome. Um, I My heart sank a little bit uh, as a Packers fan, watching them go with Jordan Morgan, a little bit more of a tackle-oriented player, over just a probably a much higher upside, better interior offensive lineman and Graham Barton, he, uh, he 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 was an awesome prospect, man. And I I think the fact that some teams went in a different direction couldn't have worked out better for the Bucks because if you can have a tackle and center trio like like this could be one of the best in the league, it is much easier to shelter your guards and make sure they're working double teams and getting slides in the right direction and just having the right guys around them to develop into good players themselves. And I think the next guy you want to talk about in that regard is Cody Mock, a second round pick last year and someone that I was, you know, pretty low on considering I really liked Luke Gedicke, loved Graham Barton. I've been very outspoken when I've liked those, um, you know, kind of early O-line picks for the Bucks. Cody Mock, I was like, yeah, I, I, I get it. I get the aesthetic. I get the athleticism, the toughness, the the trajectory, and the type of guy that the Bucks like. Um, it all was there with Cody Mock, but the tape wasn't. And it wasn't really there at North Dakota State. So that was a concern. You see the workout and the traits, and, and you like a lot of that stuff. But even at the Senior Bowl, this dude was getting worked in pass protection. And year one for him was very polarizing. There were a lot of snaps where you saw his tenacity and his athleticism work out for him. And I think in terms of pass protection, there was some stuff to like. You don't often see him lose against finesse on the inside. He has quick feet and that tackle experience that he had it in college shows. So when guys tried to beat him laterally and swim around him, he was able to recognize that stuff and stay in front of it so that's where a lot of the good came from him in pass protection but in terms of just play strength and anchor this guy was a nightmare guys took him for a ride and if not for some of that toughness and grittiness that he has he would have had even more losses because even in a lot of his losses where he was giving up a pressure he was at least you know getting his hands on him and and running his feet to the best of his ability to at least by the quarterback a, a half a second and slow the guy down as much as he could. But there was ugly losses, too, where he's just going backwards. So that was a concern coming out, and it showed up year one. Guys can improve in the weight room and get better in that department, but he is already 25 years old. He's basically the same age as Gedeke and Wirfs. And this does remind me a lot of Luke Gedeke, where – they tried that. They tried putting him inside. He was undersized. He got destroyed by power, and they were able to kick him back outside where he played in college, which is the same deal with Cody Mock, but now there's no room to move Cody, Cody Mock outside. So I'm split on him. The offensive line play around him should be really good, which should help. There is still a part of me that looks at this man, his aesthetic, and it's like, yeah, that's an NFL offensive lineman. But there was the take where it's like, if he looks like everybody else, he's probably a fourth or a fifth round pick. And I kind of agree with that. So I, I'm torn on him. Some of the flashes were nice. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt for some reason and put the arrow up on him. But that doesn't mean he isn't a massive question mark for this old line. Just as the left guard Ben Bredesen is. 
ask any Giants fan, what's it like to have Ben Bredesen as your left guard? And they will say, go play in traffic. It's not going to be fun. The tape tends to agree. He just doesn't get it in pass protection. To me, there's not really a lack of traits. It's just the hand-eye coordination, the awareness factor isn't really there. He tries to be an ass kicker in the run game. Occasionally that Michigan background, that toughness can come out, but Baltimore had him for a stint. They wanted nothing to do with him. The Giants had him for three years. He was consistently horrible, played way more than he ever should have. We questioned why he was starting for the Giants last year. Guy supposedly had a good camp, all that, and then he sucked. We saw what that Giants offensive line looked like last year. Ben Bredesen played a 1,000 snaps on that offensive line for some reason. And I don't even want to spend any more time on him because they're listing him as the starter right now, but I think it's far from a guarantee that he is because, to me, Robert Hainsey is just a much better football player and has shown much better football. I think a little bit of this is they're a little sour because Hainsey had some of his worst ever games late in the season last year. Was a joke in that um, uh, divisional round against um, Ali McNeil and, and Detroit. And he had nine penalties last year. So there were some frustrations with him. And I think that's what's leading them to want something different there. But I would feel much better about this offensive line if Hainsey was starting, whether that's him back as a center and Barton kicks out to guard, or if you just put Hainsey at guard, I, I would feel better about this old line. And the fact that they do have that option helps a little bit, but needless to say, they have questions at guard. Um, they've got some veterans that have played behind those guys. You've got Justin School, who has been very much a run block oriented tackle when he's played. Brandon Walton, who I believe got some starts under Tom Brady and like had some surprisingly decent outings. So as a backup tackle, maybe not the worst thing to have there. And then Sua Opita has started a handful of games for the Eagles and been, you know, a, a backup level player. And then they have about six other undrafted types trying to get into the mix here. One of them might make it impossible to predict who that might be. But yeah, I think you can see how this team comes in smack dab in the middle of the road for O-line. They have a brilliant tackle duo, a, a really good but rookie center in Graham Barton, and then potentially some of the worst guard play in the league. But overall, should be a pretty good group for them, assuming they can work around the guards and see some growth from that group as well. But let's rank the offense as an overall unit now that we've broken it all down. I have them as the 24th ranked offense, very close to where they were last year, where they were 20th in DVOA with a easier schedule and Dave Canales, basically. But I have them 19th in passing game, a very respectable passing game with, you know, good quarter, you know, good to adequate quarterback play, good group of weapons, an offensive line you feel pretty good about. None of this is elite, but it's all very solid with maybe the biggest question on the offense being what does the coaching look like? And if Liam Cohen is good, I think this very easily could be a top 16 passing game. Probably not a whole lot better than that, but could rank a little better than we're seeing them right there. But it is the run game where I have them very, very lowly ranked. Doesn't get any worse than this. 32nd in terms of run game. I'm low on the running backs. The run blocking should be better, but it's coming from a very low place where they were arguably the worst run blocking team in the league last year. No help from the quarterback run game. And major questions with the run game coaching as we broke down. Lots and lots to figure out in that phase of the game. But just like last year, they want to be solid offensively and really good defensively and have that be the identity of this team. So let's talk about this defense if they can repeat from last year after losing a couple of big pieces in Shaq Barrett and Carlton Davis. Let's start with the defensive line. Going to try and do a better job of reading off these uh, the grades for these groups before we dive into the players. I think that makes the most sense to do it that way. But uh, overall for defensive line, they rank 19th to 20th. So it's a very solid group. But the pass rush kind of being the question here. They rank with a C plus grade, 18th to 25th. Not it's a not that it's a bad pass rush, but is it enough? Maybe a question there. And then the defensive line run defense, very, very good. Fifth to 13th ranked D-line run defense. 
And this is a deep defensive line. They have a lot of guys that we have to talk about. But it is really all about their two interior defensive line guys in Vita Vea and Kalijah Kansi. They craft this front based on these two guys' skill sets. They lean on these two guys, especially now without Shaq Barrett, and kind of let everybody else play hard and do their thing around them. But that's why we got to start with these guys. I mean, you got Vita Vea, who is now behind Dexter Lawrence, the second best true nose tackle in the league. From a run defense perspective, he's right there with an elite grade for me. Anytime you talk about these true nose tackles where you are asking them to play two gaps, constantly deal with double teams, it is damn near impossible for them to receive, basically receive a great PFF grade as a run defender. If you see a nose tackle over a 60 grade on PFF, that means they're really good because the expectation is you're at least getting a, and without getting into the weeds too much, but I think people find this fascinating you know, if you basically just do your job as a nose tackle and you just maybe give up a half a yard and, and take up two defenders and open things up for the other guys, you're going to get a zero grade, which is going to amount to a 60 PFF grade because a 60 is all zeros across the board for their grading system. So if you see a nose tackle like Vita Vea that's got a 68 grade somewhere in the green... That's saying he's, he's for the most part, he's either doing his job or he's getting off a block making a play as a run defender. And surely the tape is much better than a 68 grade on Vita Vea. And I think everybody at PFF would tell you he's a better impact on the run than that. There is a sort of gravity about Vita Vea in, in having him and the rest of this run defense orbits around the demand he he imposes on on other offenses so he obviously makes up a mass majority of that highly graded d-line run defense grade that we just described but then you talk about him as a rusher and i would i would say he's a very good pass rusher i, I he's missing a little bit of that killer instinct and consistency i don't know if it's awareness if it's a motor issue if it's a stamina issue, but the reality is he just disappears for quarters and games at a time. And I mean, if the idea is just, he doesn't turn it on all the time is your theory here. It's that's kind of in the pudding from last season, at least. So he started really strong. Um, three of his first four games were his highest graded pass rushing games on the season. 10 of his 30 pressures for the year came in the first four games four of his six sacks came in the first month of the year then he basically disappeared for the entire season other than week 10 against tennessee when he got to play uh aaron brewer the 275 pound center who's about 100 pounds lighter than vita vea um vea had another five pressures and a sack in that game so half of his pressures came from four games last year <laughs> He just disappears, and it's really hard to explain, but it's not like that has never happened before. He just has never really taken over as this great pass rushing interior guy. But if he's a good one, and if he can turn it on in the playoffs like he did last year, where he had nine pressures and a sack in his two playoff games last year and, and was dominant, um, and then he can be that elite run defender than he is, that's a superstar nose tackle. So he's your foundation, and then... To me, Kalijah Kansi is, is a critical aspect of this team's entire season. We'll talk about the edge group. I'm not particularly high on it. But if you're talking about needing to replace those 56 pressures that Shaq Barrett gave them last year, Kalijah Kansi is going to have to take another step up last year and, and look like the guy he looked like in the playoffs and down the stretch for this team, where he was a he was an X factor for this defense. And if he can, if he can be anything close to that, you're in business with the with this Bucks team. But those two playoff games were relative outliers on his season. Again, those are the two highest graded games of his season. He ended up with a 45 pressure, six sack season, including the playoffs. But 11 of those 45 pressures and two of those six sacks came in those two playoff games. Now, he's a first-round pick. He's an uber-athlete. He's 
hyper technically sound. And there were flashes throughout the season that he was capable of that type of stuff. So there is plenty of reason to believe that you can get an impact pass rusher here, especially next to Vita Vea, who, despite what we said about him as a pass rusher, a part of him disappearing is that he does demand double teams. If you leave him one on one, especially against undersized offensive linemen that they try to get him matched up on, good night. So it is harder to slide towards a Kalijah Kansi. And you can start to um, really use the scheme and the threat of Vita Vea to pinpoint one-on-one -on -one opportunities for him. So the arrow is absolutely pointing up, heading into year two. I think you feel pretty good that he's at least going to be a good pass rusher, that he can at least be, you know, if he can be somewhere between what he was in the playoffs where he was borderline elite and what he was the rest of the season where he was more above average as a pass rusher, you're going to end up with a very good pass rusher. But can he take another leap and be that true difference maker, be, frankly, the best pass rusher on this team? They kind of need that, as we'll talk about in a minute with the edge guys. Um, but we do have to continue to talk about the interior of the defensive line just because Kalijah Kansi does have a defining weakness in that he is a, uh, you know, an abysmal run defender. He's just small. So at 285 pounds or whatever he plays at, you can only ask so much of him in run defense. And they do a very good job of uh, rotating these guys, so making it so he's not on the field for run defense. Only about uh, just eyeballing this. Let's see, 215 out of 663 snaps. What is that, like 28% of his snaps were against the run, so they do a good job scheming around it. But even when he's out there, a lot of the times it's in a base three four defense where he's a sh you know he's an inside shade. He's just splitting a gap, and he actually has run stops. He is a splash play run defender where he can blow into the backfield and make an impact within the structure of this system. And that's where you see the run game coaching um, really show up in in terms of how good this run defense can be. But if they were to just stick him out there as a three-tech every down, he would get destroyed. And that's where Greg Gaines will rotate onto the field on early downs. They'll also use Logan Hall, who's got a little bit better length and can do a lot of the stuff Kalijah Kansi does on those run defense downs. William Golston, the same idea. So they have two guys in, obviously, Vita Vea, who's going to demand the nose and allows you to take a Cansey and slide him outside a little bit more. But they've got Vea, and then they'll put Gaines in there as a two-tech if they need it. And then you got Cansey, Hall, and Golston to play either base end or pass rush D-tackle. So it's a very well-crafted interior defensive line group. And frankly, one of the better ones in the entire league. It's just the edge group is frankly one of the worst in the league. And I know that sounds harsh because Joe Tryon Trianka has, has slowly been getting better year by year. And Yaya Diaby had nine sacks last season as a rookie. And Bucks fans are going to get really excited about that. But I just don't really believe in either of these players at the end of the day. And I hope I'm wrong about that. But I mean, how much do the Bucks themselves really believe in Joe Tryon? They declined his fifth year option that would have been a $13 million cap hit. It's not like this was going to be some overpaid edge if he came back and played at $13 million. And while he's shown incremental improvement, improvements, he ended up with 30 pressures, six sacks. He has the occasional spin move or the occasional bull rush where you're like, ooh, Joe Tryon, that was nice. But for a first-round pick with incredible athletic traits, there's just been something missing there. He also, you know, he's got the size to defend the run, but he just doesn't get off blocks the way that they really want these edge defenders to do. They certainly don't think he can be what Shaq Barrett's been for them as a run defender. So it's not that he sucks. He'd be a really nice third for a team, but he's their best edge rusher. And he wouldn't start for the majority of teams in the league. So that's already going to show you where you're coming from. And then unfortunately, I'm going to probably come off as a Yaya Diaby hater for a lot of Bucks fans that are going to see the nine sack season as a rookie and say, wow, the arrow's only pointing up on him. But a lot of these sort of peripheral stats on him are just not very good. I think he was 86th out of 133 in pass rush win rate in general. 
as a baseline for a starting edge rusher, you want to see a 10% pressure rate. He was below that. His 30 pressures came on 342 pass rush snaps, so you're looking at about 9% or so there. Now, I do love what he did as a run defender, but the reality is his sack numbers were very loud and scream regression. And I have this battle with fans of teams and with this position all the time. Nine times out of ten, it plays out that way, where those numbers, the pressures, the pass rush win rate, those are the stats that are going to project future performance. And then occasionally you'll get your Max Crosby's where it's like, nope, that dude just got way better and the dude's insane and he's legit. And that's what you're praying for with Yaya Diaby, that the pass rush plan and the uh, the approach to the position and how he's able to beat tackles one-on-one is going to get better. That's what you're praying for. And I'm not going to say that can't happen, but you would maybe even expect me to put an up arrow on this guy who had a pretty good rookie season, obviously, relative to what you expected, and the sack numbers were nice. But on the flip side, I didn't see the flashes on tape, frankly, of really a repeatable way to win one-on-one reps. It's just kind of winning with athleticism, getting low, winning to the corner, or in a lot of cases, winning on all the different stunts and blitzes that this team runs. I didn't really see a lot on film that was like, oh, wow, he's really working that tackle. He's 25 years old. Yeah, he's heading into year two, but he's 25 years old. And maybe this is harsh, but it seems like he's going to look at the on-field production and be like, well, it worked for me last year. I'll just do the same thing. And again, maybe that's harsh, but um, I think he's a solid player. Again, I think if he's your three as a flamethrower off the edge, a, a physical run defender, a lot of physical tools, you can drop him into coverage and do a lot of fun stuff with him. I think he's a very useful player and a very good pick for a third round guy. But I think the expectations might be getting a little bit too high on this player. And I really hope I'm wrong, but that's just my honest stance on him. Beyond that, you still have Anthony Nelson, who's who's kind of just a smasher, a run defender, incredibly lengthy guy, um, but they like what he does for them. He contributes to the run defense as well. Um, and then they draft Chris Braz- Braswell in the second round. And he, to me, has, has probably the best upside for this edge group, at least over time, but maybe even as much as year one. I liked him. I didn't love him. I think he's stiff. Loses his balance a lot. Doesn't have a lot of power in his lower half. And he's a little bit linear or one-dimensional as a rusher. Um, He wins with the bull rush, and he wins with some lateral swipes. But he definitely has traits to be like a legit number two for an NFL defense. And we didn't say that about Diaby or Shoyanka. I feel like those guys are more, you know, third pieces for an edge room. Um, But if you want Chris Braswell to reach that upside, it's just, you know, really a matter of consistency, um, refining that pass rush plan, knowing when to go to what. Um, But I also want to see him, frankly, just defend the run with more physicality. For a Alabama run defender, he had really bad gap discipline and really bad diagnostics against the run. That was surprising to me when I watched his tape. But uh, he was a nice pick. I'm not going to project him to be a superstar, but... Could he show enough where you feel you feel comfortable letting Joe Tryon Joe Tryon walk and continuing to build this group with Braswell as as the long term number two? I think so. Um, they bring in Randy Gregory as insurance while he's getting up there in age and has completely fallen off. He just might be the best edge rusher right now if you just need someone to beat a tackle one on one. He's a useful player to have in the room, but they're hoping he doesn't have to play too much. And then you also have Jose Ramirez, a sixth-round pick last year who drew some parallels to Shaq Barrett. Um, a, a nice prospect for the sixth round, someone to at least keep an eye on, but it's a it's a crowded room. I don't know how much he's going to play. That's the problem. So there's your D-line. They've got work to do with that edge room, but you love the interior. There's a lot of good D-lines around the league. So that's how you come out with them ranking 19th to 20th with a B-minus grade with some very legitimate questions about the pass rush. But then you've got your linebackers. Uh, Very good group highlighted by Levante David, who just keeps doing it. Uh, You got a question, like, is that fall off going to come? We've already seen that he's not quite the mega star that he was, but he's still really freaking good. He's so smart. He might be the smartest linebacker in the league in terms of diagnostics and just not making mistakes. 
And I love that he's been so willing to just stick around here on some pretty team-friendly contracts. I mean, he's going to get his name in the ring of honor as, as soon as possible. I don't know if he's a Hall of Fame player or not. He's he's on the boundary, um, but he's a Bucks Hall of Famer for sure. And again, still playing at a very high level, especially in run defense. He's just so like it's not that he's undersized, but he's not the biggest guy in the world. Like 6'1, 233, 31 inch arms is like very average length. But he's just so nifty to get off of blocks, understands leverage and all that. So he can smash between the tackles. He still has pretty good speed sideline to sideline. Um, can, can track guys down and protect the perimeter. Super secure tackler. And then that headiness shows up in zone. He's got light feet. He can man guys up. What's not to love about Levante David? Even if he's getting older and, and losing a, I don't want to say a half a step, but maybe two-fifths of a step, even if that's the case, he's still a top 10 linebacker in the game. And obviously, you know, he turns 35 at the end of the season, January 23rd. Father time eventually is going to come for him, but there's nothing on tape to tell you that that's going to be this year. Where the bigger question lies for this linebacker group is LB2 in KJ Britt, who overtook Devin White as the technically the starter because he took over his run defense duties, which are going to be first and second down. So when the games would start, it would be KJ Britt, but they had the luxury of putting Devin white back out there on third down to blitz and even do some stuff in coverage that KJ Britt just probably doesn't have the physical skills to over time be a sustained LB two. But for a guy that's only played about 300 snaps in his career, he has given you some damn good run defense. And I'm, I am curious to see where this goes. I still think in a best case scenario, you look at maybe like a Jawan Bentley or Elandon Roberts in Pittsburgh, where it's like, yeah, he's a starter, but we really have to protect him in, in terms of the coverage duties. And he's never like this great linebacker. But I, I think he can earn that sort of role in the NFL as a starter clearly has um, impressed Todd Bowles inside the locker room enough that they took Devin White, a guy that Bowles did love. They took him off the field to let KJ Britt do the run duties because he actually plays with gap discipline and does his read keys and doesn't just fall for everything. Um, so showed a lot of promise, and it's just a matter of getting more playing time and showing what he can do over time a little bit more. I don't really put the up arrow on him just because I don't know how high the upside really is, but I, I guess what I'll say is his ratings of 75 in run defense and 72 overall are a little lower than how well he actually played in those phases. It's just he only played 230 snaps, so it's like how much can you really trust it? If, if that makes sense, the up arrow might be there just in the sense of if he plays more at the level he played at, he'll have earned better ratings. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I do expect him to be the starter week one as much as I love Servasia Dennis. And those that follow my draft analysis know that this is a guy I would not shut up about on the draft stream, throughout the draft process. He was my my day three dude in this in that draft class a year ago. Someone that just kind of had the complete skill set as a linebacker. Good speed, solid size, uh, a good head on his shoulders, a good tackler, good length, a really good blitzer. I thought actually showed some good flashes in coverage. A player that, as I was watching countless day three linebacker prospects, someone that actually stood out as someone that knows the position and could project as a starter in the league. Strictly speaking, from a size and skill set perspective, very similar to Levante David. Couldn't have a better mentor. And I still do see Servasia Dennis as the long-term Levante David potential replacement. Very much depending on my draft analysis of him because he just hasn't played. He's had David and Devin White and KJ Britt who earned his opportunity as that early down run defender last year. He's been behind those guys, so there's good reason to believe why he hasn't played is just because he's had good guys ahead of him, not because he's bad. And in fact, 
there was a lot of positive reports coming out of Buck's camp about Servasia Dennis last year. So I think whenever his number gets called, he has massive breakout potential. But that might not even be this year because I think they can make it work with David and KJ Britt to the point that they don't feel the need to make a change. You also have to note that J.J. Russell got a start in that uh, Panthers game last year and played really well. That's where you might start to beg the question of why wasn't that Servasia Dennis in that game? But clearly, J.J. Russell, who played well in that game, earned that opportunity. So he's another guy that I think they like. Not bad for a fourth linebacker. And then you got a competition between Vi Jones, Kalen Deloach, and Antonio Greer, probably for just one more spot in that room but they also might just keep those four. So it is a very good group with the linebackers. I know I said I was going to do a better job of reading off these position rankings before we dove into it. I did not do that with the linebackers, but they rank with a B grade overall at linebacker, 11th to 12th. C plus in coverage, mostly just because of the, the KJ Britt questions there, but 11th to 21st there. It's not horrible. And then back to a B grade in linebacker run defense, uh, ranking 5th to 10th in that tier. So it's a good group. Um, but let's talk about the secondary and let's read off their rankings before we get into the players. Um, they rank 10th to 17th for defensive back coverage. And as one of the best teams in DB run support with an A grade ranking first to 16th, uh, sorry, first to sixth. But this to me is a very fun secondary that does unfortunately have some pretty major questions, which is not a surprise considering they traded away Carlton Davis. Um, but that question mark is not going to come with their number one corner in Jamel Dean, who might not be an elite superstar corner, but he is firmly a player that you are easily happy with as your number one corner. And someone they do, uh, can do and will do everything with. He is probably at his best in press, where he is super strong. He looks like a linebacker at times, but he can jam you, get in your face, delay your release at the line of scrimmage, and then turn and run with his 4-3 speed. He's a great press man corner, but he's smart in zone. He's a risk taker. He's got good ball skills. Even if he had the drop against Detroit in the, in the uh, divisional round playoff game, I mean, if if Mike Evans and Jamel Dean didn't have those drops early in that game, they might have won that game. But uh, obviously a player I, I, I really like. I'm basically just talking so that I can continue to show some of these highlights I collected on him because he just kept standing out. But to be fair, um, those were his three highest graded games of the season the two playoff games, and then the Saints game week 17. There were some games where teams got the best of them week two against Chicago gave up 83 yards gave up 95 yards against the Niners uh, didn't have the best game against Green Bay week 15 that's you know where you see him come in that stud tier as opposed to the star tier doesn't quite have the consistency as some of those top guys so Dean obviously lays the groundwork for what we set up is a, is a very good secondary but CB2 and CB3 are, are obvious question marks here. And I, I like these guys, Zion McCollum and Christian Izian. I even have the arrow pointing up on them. But even the most optimistic of Bucks fans has to be somewhat realistic with themselves and say, yeah, I mean, these guys have to prove that they are worthy of being a CB2 and a CB3. And it's not a coincidence that the Bucks signed very capable veteran backups in the event that either of these guys don't work within their role with Bryce Hall, who can play the outside, and Tavier Thomas, who's proved he can play in the slot. We'll talk a little bit more about those guys in a second, but the Bucks very clearly are hedging uh, this with these guys. But even me, who was like as big of a Zion McCollum, pound the table for truther in the draft, has to raise questions on if he can hold up throughout the course of a season as a CB2. But you rewind the clock to the 2022 NFL Draft. And I, again, I was as high on Zion McCollum as you could have found. I had him uh, as kind of like a borderline top 50 player in that draft class. Uh, second round grade. I kept telling people, like, this guy out of Sam Houston State is going on round, you know, on day two of the draft. His traits are just too unbelievable at this position to pass up. 
Um, and, you know, fast forward to now with what we've seen from him in the pros, and you can kind of see from the tape why he fell. I think from a technique standpoint, he just was further behind than I projected. And in year one for for Zion, he had a hard time getting on the field. When he was on the field, he just didn't really know where he was. And he was getting picked on left and right. So they had to kind of take him off the field. You get to year two, and he had to kind of play by necessity because Carlton Davis was getting hurt. Um, Jamel Dean was getting banged up. So the opportunities came for Zion McCollum that way. And with Christian Izian, who was an undrafted slot corner, um, They were kind of figuring out if he was a long-term answer there as well. So McCollum was kind of all over the place, um, playing left, playing right, playing a little in the slot. And it was a a better year two for him than year one. He looked more comfortable. He had way more good games. He showed way more moments. He was playing faster. You could see some of those moments, but he still had bad games as well and still looked lost at times, got grabby at times, was out of position from zone coverage at times. So I think we've seen this kind of exact meeting of the middle between my super hyped up second round version of Zion McCollum and what the NFL saw in him as more of a fifth round developmental corner, but developmental to the highest degree. I thought he would get drafted higher strictly because of the size, speed, athletic traits combination. The workout he put up will be hard for anyone to beat. I mean, a 4 3 3 40 with a 3 9 4 shuttle, 6 4 8 3 cone at 6 2, 200 pounds, even did 15 bench reps, which isn't bad for a corner, but a 40 inch vertical jump, 11 inch broad jump. I mean, this is built in a lab tools for the position. So if good coaching and the right work ethic can steer this in the right direction, this arrow could not just be pointing up, but it could be pointing up in the sense that, like, this guy could be an alpha, a true number one elite corner, like with the traits. But it's a big year for him, man. He, they, they're clearly believing in him, giving him this opportunity. Um, they traded away Carlton Davis, uh, Carlton Davis, to open up this door. He's 25 years old. This is it, and we probably don't need to spend any more time on it because he is just the classic polarizing kind of boomer bust starter for this team. I'm thrilled as a Zion McCollum truther that they're giving him the chance, but I'm also going to, you know, say, Hey, there's some bad on tape. We've seen the bad on tape and you're hoping that's not who he is. So you got questions there. And then at, at, at the slot corner position, uh, I like Christian Izian. I think he showed that he can get through a season as a starting caliber slot corner for a team had some really good moments. He's a nasty physical scrappy run defender from the slot but how can you not raise questions about an undrafted slot corner heading into his second season, right? I I think from a floor perspective, it's probably higher than Zion McCollum felt like he really settled in as a, you know, not just that frisky, you know, quick slot run defender that the bucks have just loved all these guys from Jordan Whitehead to what Antoine Winfield has been at times. This is their type on and on and on to drafting Tyke Smith this year. Um, I, I think he fills that void for them. But from a coverage perspective, I think, you know, really settled in as the year went on. So I, I shouldn't need to explain why you need to give him a little bit more time to prove what he can do. They clearly seem to have found something undrafted here. And it's not like he has any sort of physical deficiencies either. Yeah, he's smaller, and that's likely why he went undrafted out of Rutgers. But, uh, you know, he ran and tested really well uh, to his to his own right. So, again, arrow pointing up on him. He very well might ascend as, as one of the solidified good starting slot corners in the league. And it's also fair to say that um, I, I think other than – I mean, maybe even more than running back. I feel like slot corner is where the most undrafted starters come from in the league. So he's got that working in his favor as well. Now, as we mentioned, they signed some very, very nice pieces for cheap love. I mean, I've uh, Jason Light in this front office has really impressed me for a while now, but these signings just make so much sense. Got Bryce Hall, who was a player that, everybody felt should have been drafted higher than the sixth round or whatever it was in like 2020. 
Um, but he got on the field as a rookie for the Jets, looked really good, but then they replaced him with Sauce Gardner, right? And it's like, what are you going to do? You got replaced by Sauce. It's not your fault. And then he was just depth piece because those corners have stayed healthy for the Jets, but made all the sense in the world for them to look at him and be like, yeah, that guy probably should get another opportunity somewhere. So you do have some insurance if Zion's really struggling. You can go to Bryce Hall and see what you have in him. Granted, he has question marks in his own right because he hasn't really played for a few years, but love that signing as outside insurance. And then love the Tavier Thomas as slot insurance. If Izian's good games were a blip last year and he is an undrafted talent and just falls off, which is certainly possible. Tavier Thomas has been a really good piece for the Texans in the slot for like four years now. Really hard to see him being a liability from the slot um, and could be as much as a good slot corner for them. So those two signings make perfect sense. And then it'll probably be a competition for the developmental corner six spot between Josh Hayes and probably Tyrick Funderburk, who's getting some hype early. It was a fun name that some people liked. So you certainly have depth, maybe even better depth than a lot of the teams we've talked about, but questions in terms of if you have the right starters for the job. And then it's a really good safety room. You got Antoine Winfield. And I would just like to take a moment to say that not you guys watching this video, but NFL fans, you're fucking stupid because Antoine Winfield was not voted into the Pro Bowl, which was a disgrace. And one of the biggest disgraces in the history of the disgrace that is the Pro Bowl. I mean, this dude had the best safety season other than maybe Jesse Bates inside this division, which it's worth noting the, the safety play that we're getting in the NFC South. But it was either Antoine Winfield or Jesse Bates. No in between. Sorry, Ravens fans. Kyle Hamilton can be third there. But from a coverage perspective and actually playing safety, like, you know, more than 10 yards back behind the line of scrimmage. Um, yeah, it's it's Winfield or Bates. A anyway, I mean, the, the, the flexibility that he brings this defense, it's uh, I have a hard time putting words to it. They they blitz him. They man him up. They go too high. They go single high. They go quarters. You can literally do whatever you want with Antoine Winfield. He can cover whoever you want him to cover. And then how can you not love that he's basically taken after his father, who I don't want to say he invented the physical slot corner um, like archetype in the NFL, but for a guy that was roughly in his prime you know 2004 to 2010 where nickel defenses were becoming much more prominent i mean he's up there for like the grandfather uh, godfather slot corner so you gotta love that his son has taken after that in terms of just throwing his head in the mud tackling being strong and physical he is um, from a practical standpoint, maybe the best run defending safety in the league. Um, not necessarily from like a length and disruptive, like he's going to blow you up and, and have this dominant win uh, as like a stack shed full size, like Derwin James, Kyle Hamilton, Cam Chancellor type of um, safety. But from a practical point of view, tackling consistency, pursuit angles, speed to the ball, volume in terms of just rallying and tackling and it's not like he doesn't get off blocks and can't handle that side of things he he might be the best run defending safety as well so i i just i've run out of praises at this point for for antoine he's he's my dude i'm, I'm trying to get a signed jersey at some point so bucks fans if you have a way for me to get a signed antoine winfield jersey on the wall behind me hit me up i'd love to buy one um but yeah love antoine I think the only thing you're missing is the lack of an elite coverage grade on him. Um, it's just they ask so much of him that it's it's almost impossible for him to be what I would describe as an elite coverage defender because he still does give up some plays, as do pretty much all these safeties. But relative to all of the safeties in the league, he is stickier in coverage, makes more plays on the ball, and a smarter zone defender. So having that dude's a game changer. Um, and then I like bringing Jordan Whitehead back other than it's going to keep my guy Tyke Smith off the field for a little bit. But uh, Jordan Whitehead made so much sense for this Bucks team. They they just love... It, it almost feels like they don't have 
safeties, they just have three slot corners with how much they just move these guys around and do all this stuff. Um, granted, you know, someone has to drop deep occasionally, um, and that's going to be both Winfield and Jordan Whitehead. But, yeah, he just schematically makes so much sense because he's a converted slot corner. I mean, all their safeties are converted slot corners. Antoine Winfield, Jordan Whitehead, Tyke Smith now. It's their type. They want the guy that can run man coverage, has light feet, can run quarters if you need it. But they target those guys in this system for a reason. And, yeah, Whitehead's just a, a tuned-down version of Antoine Winfield. Frisky, quick, versatile, but not shut down. I'll just take the dial of everything we said about Antoine Winfield, turn it down, you know, 15%. Bringing him back made total sense. It's not like he was bad for the Jets. They just wanted to go in a different direction. I think he'll pick right back up as a really good safety for the Bucks. And it is worth noting as well that, like, Ryan Neal missed a ton of tackles. He was a bit of a problem point for this defense. And getting someone they trust back there is, I, I think, going to – go a long way towards trying to make up for Carlton Davis. Even if McCollum isn't as good as Carlton Davis, um, it can help bridge that gap for sure. Uh, but then my dude, Tyke Smith, easily one of my favorite players in this draft class, regardless of draft position. And you want to know why I liked Tyke Smith so much? I don't know. My pro comp on him was Antoine Winfield Jr., who we just broke down for two minutes and raved about. I see so many similarities in Tyke Smith's game, starting with the physical traits. I mean, they're almost the exact same size, the exact same athletic ability. The movement skills on film look the same. Like, it was the tape that made me want to compare him to Antoine Winfield, and then he worked out, and I was like, oh my god, that actually might be Antoine Winfield again. The way he's he is in coverage with the quick twitch and the ball skills... I wish so badly that the SEC would let me show footage of their players without getting copyrighted. Um, but you just got to either trust me or, or go watch the film yourself. He is so good in coverage. Didn't play a lot of free safety. And a lot of people looked at that and said, well, he's more of a slot corner than a safety. And yes, that's true based on what he's done. But case in point, the safeties on this team, Jordan Whitehead was a slot corner in college. Antoine Winfield played mostly from the slot for the Gophers. It's not just this team. Someone like Javon Holland was almost exclusively slot corner for Oregon. Now he's one of the best free safeties in the league. So that's that's not that hard of a transition for a guy with speed in the 4-4s to make. He has all of the range and ball skills to play free safety. It's more just like he was even better as a slot corner uh, was in more playmaking opportunities for Georgia, and they already had a pair of safeties to play deep. So I do think Tyke Smith could play deep safety if they asked him to, especially for the Bucks, where that's what they do. So he's got a roadblock in front of him. They're going to trust Christian Izian as the slot corner based on how he played last year, and they're going to trust Jordan Whitehead based on the fact that he's done it for this team before, and they paid him $12 million to, to be that guy. But I do think the talent is there for Ty Key to, to get out there at some point, whether it's running more dime, which the Bucks don't run a ton of dime. They prefer two linebackers out there. But now that Devin White's gone and the fact that they have more depth in the secondary, do they get into more dime just to get a guy like Ty Key Smith on the field? I think that's possible. And if you have basically four of these guys that can do everything between Winfield, Whitehead, Izian, and Tyke Smith. That can be a complete headache under a good defensive coordinator like Todd Bowles. Um, but I also think there's a case where, like, if Jordan Whitehead misses a game, or even if Antoine Winfield misses a game and Tyke Smith plays that safety spot and he balls out, they might move Jordan Whitehead down the depth chart a little bit and go with Tyke Smith. So I just, I love the fit from a scheme point of view. It's just the opportunity is going to have to come, but absolute arrow pointing up all eyes on Tyke Smith. He is such a fun watch behind him. You do have Kayvon Merriweather, uh, who's a, a limited athlete, went undrafted for a reason, but he's, he's capable depth. He had to play some games last year and, and didn't look lost. So if he could clean up his tackling, uh, you'd feel a little better about him, but he's, uh, he's not horrible as a, as a fourth safety. 
And that is uh, probably going to conclude the the defense. I don't see Banks or or Wisdom having room on the 53-man roster. But at the end of the day, I, I do wish I could rank this secondary higher, but I got to keep it honest and and be honest about who Zion McCollum has been to this point, what, what Christian Izian is uh, heading into year two. But if those guys reach their upside, this could damn well be a top three secondary in the freaking league. And if that happens, that's potentially your path to this Bucks team, not just repeating what they did last year, but being even better. I mean, obviously they had Carlton Davis last year, but they didn't have the safety depth that they have or, or even a, a starter like Jordan Whitehead or Tyke Smith last year. So it could be a more complete secondary. But with those questions, only time will tell. So when you put all that together, where does this defense rank for me? It actually cracks the top 10. They rank ninth for me. But second in run defense, I really think they're going to play elite run defense this year, just as they've done. I mean, they were seventh in DVOA run defense last year. But whereas a lot of these teams fluctuate year to year in terms of run defense, the Bucs with Todd Bowles and Vita Vea, like that's about as safe of a bet to be a great run defense as as they come. And I think you could argue um, getting a full year without Devin White will be even better for their run defense because he was kind of a weak spot for that that unit. But in terms of pass defense, they rank exactly in the middle of the league, 16th. They have good players. It's just, I really, it, it does, I mean, the edge room leaves a lot to be desired, uh, even if the cornerback room does hit, and that would raise up the pass defense grade a little bit, obviously, but... I do think this defense is going to be missing a little bit of that fear factor if there's not much of a threat off the edge. So it might keep them outside of the top 10 in terms of pass defense, but they could get close. And then you're talking about this being maybe the sixth or seventh best defense in the league. That's probably their best path towards repeating as a playoff team, which is ultimately what this team is hoping to accomplish this year. But we do still got to talk about the special teams before we bring Trevor in here. Um, So they rank 16th for for special teams as well, which is interesting because they actually have the highest graded kicker in the NFL, or at least tied with Justin Tucker, strictly based on uh, PFF kicker grade there. I'm not making up my own kicker grades here. We're just defaulting to PFF there. Um, So you can blame Trevor, I guess, in just a minute. Um, That Chase McLaughlin grades out as well as Justin Tucker. But the dude's been a freaking monster. They signed him from Indianapolis Uh, this most recent season, and and he was just freaking pinpoint accurate. So you do have that. But beyond him, you have kind of an average punter in Jake Camarda, and then they actually graded out quite poorly in terms of the PFF team grade. They ranked 26th. Again, you can blame Trevor. It's obviously all his fault. And then uh, the DVO, uh, the DVOA grade wasn't too much better either. They ranked 18th to 19th there. So some of their return stuff and their uh, kind of coverage stuff clearly wasn't checking all the boxes there. They're going to want to improve in that department with the new special teams coordinator. Uh, but they still come out ranking 16th with a very solid special teams. And as long as you have a good kicker, it's pretty tough for special teams to like tank your season, even if they have some stuff to clean up. But let's wrap this up so we can get to that interview with Trevor, uh, recapping what their strengths and weaknesses. To me, they don't actually have the longest list of strengths, which could be a reason I'm a little bit lower on them, but they have a dynamic group of weapons, even if they don't necessarily rank as a top 10 group for me. They were close. Um, They have all the skill sets they need to thrive. They have that diversity of skill sets that you're always looking for. Um, I mean, the all-around run defense is a clear strength. Hell, they ranked second in the league for run defense. But really, all three levels, they're solid and the coaching. So it's just incredibly high floor in terms of their ability to get to third down and knock it ran all over. Um, And then the interior pass rush should be damn good. Question is, listed as a weakness and a question mark there, how much does the lack of edge rush hold them back? And how much are teams going to be able to just focus on Kalijah Kansi and Vitavea. Can you leave those edge guys on an island and direct your attention towards helping out on the inside? Um, probably their biggest weakness is going to be the run game. They have got to prove that they can run the ball to put Baker Mayfield in more advantageous situations. As fun as his 
kind of reemergence was last year. This was not some overly explosive offense last year, and the lack of a run game was a huge part of that. Got to get better there. They have to prove that the new offensive coordinator as well can help them get there and get back to what they did last year. And then, of course, those unknowns in the secondary. And at the end of the day, those are four very prominent weaknesses and questions for this team that this Bucks team is going to have to answer. But let's take a look at their schedule. Uh, we obviously expect this to be harder than what they had to go through last year, just with the division hopefully being a little bit tougher this year. It starts off basically with two winnable games, Washington and Denver at home, and then two very tough games at Detroit and against Philly. So you're hoping you can emerge two and two from that. It, but if you don't, that's going to be a sign that this team is in trouble because you got two tough road games, two divisional road games at Atlanta, at New Orleans. I think they're underdogs in both those games. Then Baltimore Ravens, Atlanta comes to town, who I do have as the number one ranked team in this division, obviously. Then you got at the Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs, and you have to play the Niners defending NFC champs. If they can win two out of those six games and walk out of that stretch four and six, you're feeling pretty good about the start to this team season. So the schedule definitely starts harder, but it does lighten up quite a lot after that. And this could look a little bit like last year where, I mean, what did this team start? Like one and six last year? And then they ended up going on a run, making the playoffs? That could happen again because you get Giants, Panthers, Raiders, Chargers, Panthers again, Saints again. Six of their last seven teams are teams that we rank lower than the Bucks in this series. And then you do have to go to Dallas in there, which is not easy. But uh, yeah, I guess don't give up on the Bucks if they start slow. And I won't be taking any victory laps until the end of the year on this Bucks team either. In terms of their over-under, seven and a half wins, that sounds almost exactly correct to me. My projection has them at 7.6. I mean, I do think this team's floor is, is pretty nice. They're going to be in almost all of the games they play just because they defend the run and are a frisky team. I uh, have some playmakers on offense. So even if I am, I guess, lower on the Bucks, um, you know, I, I don't think I'd bet the under on this team. But I, clearly that's lower on the Bucks relative to the fact that they made the playoffs last year. Vegas clearly isn't that high on the Bucks. They're tied for 20th in Super Bowl odds. They're over under here at seven and a half is right on par with all the teams we've done so far. They're about three to one to win the division, which that adds up to me. If if they if they did this division, you know, if we played this division four times, I think they win it once. So that makes sense to me in terms of the division odds. Definitely don't see this as a Super Bowl caliber team. I wouldn't spend your money there, but I guess what I'm getting at here is I'm much closer to where Vegas views the Bucks than I think Bucks fans view the Bucks. But that's a fun transition to ask. A Bucks fan, how he views the Bucks, bringing on the amazing Trevor Sikama from PFF. Do not go anywhere. You're not going to want to miss this interview. And now I am thrilled to welcome, for the third year running, back to the Bucks deep dive, Trevor Sikama of PFF and the NFL Stock Exchange podcast. Trevor, how you doing, buddy? Marcus, it's so good to be with you, my friend. Third time in a row, the three-peat here as we try to figure out what exactly the Buccaneers are going to be. It's Sort of been to, I mean, like, you know, the, the post Super Bowl years, we had a good idea of what the team was going to be like. They were going to be good. But ever since then, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster. So I'm excited to kind of unpack it here with you, my friend. It, yeah, I was actually going to, that was going to be my transition from whatever you said was it's been a roller coaster, dude, because uh, the first year you came on, I actually had them ranked first. I was an idiot. They barely made the playoffs and then got just pounced by the Cowboys. And then I overreacted to that, had him ranked 28th last year. You were on here like early June talking bucks with me because I go in order of the power rankings. And now it's like, where are they at? I've got them ranked 23rd heading into next year. So what is your reaction to when you hear 23 there? I, I think that's a little low. I think that they could certainly be a little bit higher. Now, the big issue with the Bucks is sort of the inconsistency, right? I think that every single week you can look at basically every game of their season. Now, some of the better opponents, okay, you obviously give them the advantage just because of how they've played and the longevity of their success. But I don't think Tampa's going to go into a lot of games this year, if any at all, where you go, yeah, they have no shot. Like, they're a team with a decently high ceiling if everything's working out. 
but then also it's, you know, sort of the changes, the new offensive coordinator change again. Like is Todd Bowles going to continue to evolve as a head coach? Cause sometimes it feels like he hasn't, you know, what version of Baker Mayfield are they going to get? Like the, the aging top tier players that they have, are they going to be able to continue to carry this team? You know, Levante, David, Mike Evans, those guys, you know, so it's just the, the bucks are sort of tough to figure out. I, I, I don't totally hate you having them in the early 20s. I'd probably argue for them to be a little bit higher just off the top of my head without seeing the list. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely a team that the floor or sorry, the ceiling is decently high as a team that obviously made it a pretty good playoff run last year. But the floor is also lower than you would feel comfortable with probably putting a team in the top 20. So that's sort of my yeah. overall outlook with them. Yeah. So you mentioned Baker Mayfield a little bit, but the contract comes in three years, hundred million. What was your kind of like as a fan, like what was the kind of impression on you? And um, I, I guess I'll, I'll have a follow-up question after that, but yeah, what was your impression when the contract came in on Baker? How'd you feel about it? I mean, they had to, right. And when I say had to, I mean, that sort of seems harsh because it was also well-deserved. Like this was the move that they should have always made. Do you look at Baker Mayfield and say like, okay, is this guy for sure somebody who's going to win a Super Bowl for you? Maybe not, but it's basically like there were no other options other than Baker being the starting quarterback for this team that were going to make it viable to see a really successful 2024 season, especially Mm -hmm. for where they were picking in the draft. Like they were just, they were never going to get one of those super talented quarterbacks that we saw at the very top of the draft. That was never going to happen. And to be honest with you, Baker deserved that deal. He absolutely deserved that deal because I think that the way that he finished last year specifically, even if you take out the playoff run itself, because I think a lot of people just, you know, drape the fact that's like oh you know he you know he won a playoff game at home and they were down to the wire with the lions like okay yes those two performances were big but you got to look at sort of the entire year from him and the journey that it was and i think that he was very hot and cold at the beginning of the season there's a lot of factors to go into that lack of a run game dave Canales trying to figure things out like baker mayfield himself trying to figure things out with his first year with the team but in the second half of the season he played pretty dang well, especially yeah. down the stretch. I mean, when you look at from week 14 on, let me make sure that I got my numbers right here. All four of his 300 yard games came after week 14 for a guy who had 30 big time throws and 24 turnover worthy plays, which is closer to 50, 50 than you would want it to be. Yeah. From week 14 on 16 big time throws, only seven turnover worthy plays. And when you look at that stretch, you have to think to yourself, okay, well then this is somebody who realistic expectations getting acclimated in the first half of the year, coming on strong in the second half of the year. That to me was enough, especially his performances in the playoffs as well to say, yeah, three-year deal, hundred million dollar deal for him. Like that is, that was the perfect move. It was the correct move for Jason light to make. I think it was the correct move for Baker Mayfield to make. And it was just the right move for the Buccaneers overall. I think it, it, not even in a we're pigeonholed kind of a way. I guess they were a little bit, but that doesn't take away the fact that it was deserved, I think, from Baker's side of things. Yeah, that'll be the the most interesting thing at the end of the day. Obviously, quarterback play is so important. I think you're looking at a quarterback that has been streaky throughout his career. Right. That'll be the biggest factor for the Bucs, I think, for next year. Is like, okay, was that him just getting comfortable and things were working itself out? Or was this, I always call back to like, I think it was Sam Darnold's either rookie year or his second year, like the last four weeks of his season, he like looked like an elite quarterback. It's like, okay, or was he just getting hot at the right time, earn some money, and we got a Daniel Jones situation on our hands here. So that, that'll that be the most interesting thing for, for next year. So I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, let's talk a little bit about this run game because watching some film for this team, getting ready for this, I was like, I can't wait to ask Trevor, like, why can't this team run the damn football? And it's, it wasn't just last year. Like this was a thing in the Tom Brady era. Like there was a reason they were always like number one in passing attempts every year. It's like, what, what do you, I guess if you had like a pecking order of what's wrong or if there's one thing where... Well, why can't they run the ball, Trevor? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if if you want to go back to some of the roots, um, Ali Marpet retiring when he did, surprisingly, to the team, um, they might have had a little bit more of a heads up than you know, us on the outside of things, but I still believe that Marpet going, yeah, I'm done. 
like with plenty left in the tank to be a damn good football player, that mm-hmm. really hurt them because when you combine that with losing Alex Kappa, and I think they were fully prepared to lose Alex Kappa, right? I think that they were like, okay, this is fine. We can make up for it. We got a good, the rest of the interior offensive line is fine. But all of a sudden now within the span of a year, losing um, Ali Marpet and losing Alex Kappa to free agency, because that probably wasn't in their plans when that happened. And then um, Ryan Jensen's Jensen's knee falls apart, getting hurt all of a sudden there. Now you go, Oh, okay. We have zero interior offensive line, zero. Mm -hmm. And I think a testament to that being true is the fact that they were trying to play Luke Gedeke on the interior because they had to, because they had to. And look at how much better he played when they moved him out to tackle this year, this past year. He was so much better. And I think that they probably knew that at the time, but there was nothing they could do about it. They had Mm -hmm. to play. They had to get bodies on the interior offensive line. So, even you know snowballing that into last year, yeah, it kind of looks better. They signed some veterans. They've got Filer. They've got Hainsey. You know, they draft Cody Mock, who they like. Um, they have Stinney as well. But it's like, man, it still isn't. You don't feel great about it. You don't feel great about that group. And I think the timeline was so accelerated sure. for when they would have to replace those really good interior offensive linemen that they have just been trying to play catch up ever since. I think it's going to be better this year, right? I, I love the Graham Barton pick. I think that he's going to start at center. He's going to be a rock for him. I think he's going to be good. And he's a rookie right in the offensive line. So it's going to yeah. take, take some time. He's not going to be an all pro right away, but I think he's going to be good. Uh, sorry to cut you off, but yeah. I think what happened to John Michael Schmitz last year has changed all of our thoughts a little bit on like, it, it, can the best center in the class really have that high of a floor? Like how, how bad going to be? Right, right, right. And it's just, you yeah, think he's going to be good, but. And I, you know, Ian Beckles, he's a former offensive lineman for the bucks. Um, when I was still living down in Tampa, I would go on his podcast all the time and, and he and I were good buddies. And, um, he told me one day he's because he knew I was a draft guy. So I'd talk up these young guys, talk of these rookies and talk about, Oh, you know, they draft guy, this guy in the second round, he's going to help. And he'd be like, Trevor rookies suck. <laughs> All right, like that's it. And like that, like, and he was just like very plainly say to me, he's like, first year players suck, and and, yeah. and obviously he's you know being a little bit hyperbolic with it, but you got to have realistic expectations. But I think that also goes into expecting Cody Mock to be a little bit better this year, right? This is a guy who you know, played tight end at North Dakota State. You know, they moved him to offensive tackle. Now you're moving him to the interior. You know, he's already a little bit of an undersized guy, so that was always going to be a work in progress for him. So another year with him starting to right guard, I think he's going to be a lot better because he struggled last year. His BFF grades, whether it was, you know, pass blocking, run blocking, zone blocking, man gap scheme, what whatever, like it wasn't good for Cody Mock. It was a big yeah. learning year. He was baptized by fire last year. There's no doubt about it. So you know, with them having an upgraded center, I think with Graham Barton, even with him as a rookie, another year with Cody Mock, you've got your two solidified offensive tackles. Uh, ben Bredesen probably picking up that left guard spot. He's got some experience there at the very least. Like, I think the answer to your question is, sure, they haven't had this, like, incredibly dynamic running back. I know we'll probably talk about Rashad White here, but, yeah. like, you know, they haven't had this like incredible, like all pro back that they've had to lean on. But I think Rashad White has been good given the circumstances and the circumstances have been the interior of the offensive line has straight up for Tampa, not been good enough. And I think that's kind of what gets us to this place. But I do think that this year should be better than the, the couple of years past. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great breakdown. Um, I do want to talk about Rashad White. I'm I'm pretty damn low on him as a runner. It's he, I think his most polarizing running back just receiving skills are like top three to five. And then honestly, I would have him in the bottom three of starting running backs as a runner in the league. I'm curious if you're quite that low on him. For me, it's it's really just like the vision and the instincts. It's like there's something missing with him. Not just that he bounces runs outside, but I just feel like he's very decommittal as a runner. Um Maybe this is a weird take, but it feels like he's never able to get up to that top speed as a runner because he's always kind of second guessing himself. I'm curious if you're kind of seeing similar things or if you're a little higher on him. You know, it's 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 hard to be too harsh on him because what I just said, like it's really hard yeah. for any running back to succeed behind a bad offensive line. Just ask Saquon Barkley, right? I think, and, and you know, he's not the only one. But you know, when you look at Rashad, there are a couple of statistics that we have at PFF that at least help try to separate a running back and his individual talent and his ability 
away from the offensive line in front of them. One is missed tackles force per attempt, right? How often are you making guys miss? Uh, and then the other one is yards after contact per attempt, because, you know, if you get hit in the backfield, you know, how many yards do you get after contact? If you get hit at the line of scrimmage, how many yards do you get after contact? If you, if your offensive line does a great job and you get to the second level, okay, where well, you're going to get contact eventually, how many yards are you getting after contact? And I know it's not a perfect science. I'm not trying to say that it is, but in both of those categories, you know, Rashad White, you want to have your missed tackles force per attempt average at least above 0.20. So the, like that's mm-hmm. that's kind of the, the barometer of like you want to at least be above that. You know, if you're above 0.30, it's like, okay, like you're pretty dang good at making guys miss on a play-by-play basis. And if you're above four, I mean, you're going to have one of the best marks in the league. You're going to be known as one of the most yeah. elusive backs in it's the like NFL. like Bijan in college. That was Bijan in college, right? Yeah. I mean, like tra- like uh, Travis Etienne in college, Shavante Williams in college. Like these dudes were just, whether it was through contact or whether it's through speed, like they were making guys yeah. miss all over the place at a rare level. Rashad White, over the last two years, missed tackles force per attempt averages 0.14, 0.12. So well below that 0.20 mark that you at least want them to be at. And then when it comes to yards after contact as well, you kind of want that number to be, you know, if if the if the if the yards per attempt barometer is t- typically like four, you know, you like you'd like to see a running yeah. back have at least more than four yards per carry as an average. The yards after contact average you want above three. I think that would that would be a good sign of things of you um, making good run plays, even if they're bad. If there's bad blocking in front of you, he's been below three in each of the last two seasons. So not only does he have a low yards per carry average, he also has a low yards after contact average. All of that to say. A better offensive line, I does think, help him. And I think that he is great as a receiver. You mentioned, I think he brings a ton in the receiving game. I think that that's a really important part of what the Bucs want to do this year. But it's sort of a combination of the interior offensive line just straight up has not been good enough. And Rashad White has not necessarily been this dynamic make up for it type of a back with vision or elusiveness or balance through contact over these last two years. So I do think that there is a higher ceiling for white than even what we have seen right now. Um, But it's going to take a all around effort of him taking the next step and the offensive line taking the next step. I think for us to see that. Awesome. Um, All right. So one more offensive question. Uh, And you know, it's it's fairly straightforward with I want to talk about the coordinator here. It's fairly mm-hmm. straightforward with Liam Cohen stepping in. I feel like schematically speaking, a- unless you have something to add to it, I mean, it should be pretty dang similar. It comes from the Sean McVay tree and they just want to kind of this whole team. They just want to kind of pick up where they were last year. So from that point of view, I feel like it's a pretty reasonable hire. Um, but as far as like how good he's going to be, where are your kind of expectations? Do you feel really good about him? Or are you a little worried that there is going to be a drop off with some of the kind of like predictable nature that comes with being a coordinator that Canales was so good at? I'm actually really excited about Liam Cohen. And, you know, I've been, I, I, I've known who Liam Cohen is since, you know, 2020, 2021, when he was the offensive coordinator for Levis's offenses, right? When we were taking a mm-hmm. good look at Will Levis when he was at Kentucky, obviously he bounces over to LA for one year in 2022, heads back to Kentucky in 2023. And, you know, I think that he's got that play calling experience. It seems as though Todd Bowles, who is a heavy defensive minded head coach, is very comfortable saying, you take it. Like, like this yeah. is not going to necessarily be a Los Angeles Rams situation where it's like, yeah, okay, Liam Cohen's involved in the offense and play calling and things like that. But I mean, it's Sean McVay, right? It's Sean McVay's right. offense. He's the one who's the head of things. When he was at Kentucky, it, it felt as though he had almost autonomous control in 2021 and in 2023. And it feels like what he's going, the situation that he has with the Bucks is going to be much more catered to that. Now, I think people like to talk about, oh, it's the same offense, it's the same terminology, all that kind of stuff. You know, I I don't think that's as big of a deal as fans or sometimes media members who are asking the Mm -hmm. questions like tend to make it. I think it's going to be fine. They've got plenty of time to figure this thing out. You're also playing with professional athletes, so it's not like you're teaching the offense for the first time. I actually like when coordinators go from college to the NFL because you teaching a high school kid. Yeah, terminology in an actual offense and an actual defense is sometimes a massive ask. And it's it's not as much when you get to the NFL. These guys kind of know the drill. You know, the thing that I'm looking forward to the most with Liam Cohen is I think he's going to be able to hit the ground running in what 
he wants to do and the vision that he has for the offense more than Canales. I think that Canales had a really great open mind to things. I think he was like, hey, we're going to figure out what our players' best strengths are. We're going to try things. We're going to, you know, it's going to be a mixed bag of results for a little bit. And it was through the first half of the season. Because when you look at, when you look at Tampa's offense, whether it was like run pass balance or whether it was inside zone or man gap scheme or like whatever it is, like they were pretty much dead even in so many of these categories, maybe not necessarily in like total attempts, but it, like the bucks were right around the middle of the pack in the league when it came to inside and outside zone concepts and also man gap blocking concepts. So it's like they didn't really know exactly what their bread and butter was. They were just trying both to see what worked. And I think the same was the case for, okay, how much do we run versus how much do we pass mm -hmm. Canalis and having an open mind and, and putting players in their best position to succeed. That's a good thought process to have, but last year was a big learning year for him. And I don't think the bucks were able to really hit the ground running the way that they, they can with Cohen, who I think is much more solidified and maybe what he wants to do specifically when it comes to play action, because in 2021 yeah. and in 2023, he was top 25 in the country in total play action rate. The bucks were bottom half in the league last year in, I think it was total play action plays run, or at least percentage of play action plays run and percentage of passing yards off of play action. They were both bottom half of the league. Mm. I think that changes this year. I think that, with Cohen, you get a, a much more of a leaning into where the game is going, sort of these modern ways to call offenses. And so I think that he is just going to be more confident right out of the gate than Canales was. That's really interesting. That's surprising to me that they were bottom half in play action. Um, definitely felt like those were a lot of Baker's best reps. Like he seemed really comfortable, you know, turning his back to the defense, whipping that head around and then just like trust in those intermediate throws. He had some like Tua like moments there. I felt like late in the year where he was just really trusting it. Um, and you know, that could be for better or worse, but I think it for the, for the most part is, is good. Um, all right. I got a, a couple of players in the defense. I want to ask you about, and then I want to try to get to this uh, fantasy draft at the end. Cause okay. uh, that's, that's fun. And I know we both are, we're, we have the same, uh, you know, bones in terms of, we, we love a good uh, Madden style draft. Yes. Uh, yes. But, uh, yeah, the, the defense we're all pretty familiar with um, schematically and, and a lot of the players, but there are some very young new pieces in the secondary that I think uh, put some very big questions on this team this year. Probably the biggest of which is Zion McCollum, who right now is slated to start for them. They did sign some, um, you know, nice veteran pieces there. But what have you seen from McCollum and what's your confidence level for him heading into year three here? Yeah, I mean, obviously, McCollum is somebody who they love the size and the speed. You know, six foot two, a little over 200 pounds. I mean, he's got a crazy mock draftable chart with how athletic this guy is. And I think just that potential overall and everything that I've heard from him about him being, you know, a hard worker, somebody wants to do the dirty work, not afraid to try to come up and tackle as best as he possibly can. Like, those are all things that Todd Bowles loves. And, and, and you know, when I look at McCollum, though, I think the biggest area that he still has to improve and for corners, he's still on a relatively expected path because it's really mm -hmm. hard to play corner at the in the NFL. He's still learning the anticipation parts of things. Zero interceptions in each of the last two years. I mean, he played sparingly his rookie year, but he played a decent amount last season. Still no interceptions. And I think even though I hate like pointing to interceptions as like a necessarily like a key stat for corners, it is for McCollum because his biggest issue right now is he needs to anticipate better. And I guarantee you because of his length and because of his, you know, like size and speed combination, if he anticipates better, you start getting turnovers. You start getting more forced incompletions. He had 10 forced incompletions last year compared to one the previous season. And I think that was at least a hint at a step in the right direction that he is picking it up a little bit more. But, you know, I was watching a little bit of his film uh, this morning just to kind of give myself a refresher yeah. before this podcast. And there's a lot of moments where, He's just a tick late. He is he's yeah. seeing it and then reacting. And when you play corner in the NFL, you got to see it before it happens. I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of positions where that's the case, but certainly cornerback is one of those where it's paramount to getting some of those best plays, the pass breakups, the interceptions, things like that. So um, I, they very clearly have a lot of faith in in who he is and what he can be as an outside corner. Um, there's a reason to believe it, but there's certainly another step that he's got to take. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the other guy I want to talk about is one of my favorite players in this draft, Tyke Smith. 
Uh, I'm curious, where did you end up having Ty Key? And then uh, to piggyback off of that, how much, if at all, do you think we see him this year? That's a really good question. Where did I have him big board wise? I'm uh, I'm doing this on the fly now. Uh, I had him tied for uh, I'll, I'll I'll fill the space while you look it up. I, okay. I had him tied for my number one safety in this draft. I just I was obsessed with him. OK, so I wasn't as high on him as you were. He was just outside of my top 100, but I thought that okay. he should be a late third, early fourth round pick type of a player. And what I like about him is. I love how physical he can be as a slot defender. Now, I also think mm -hmm. that he's got the size and the strength to be able to play more traditional safety roles, like as a strong safety if you want him to be. But it did feel like some of his best plays, certainly at Georgia. I know he had the West Virginia track with him being a safety, but you know, certainly him at Georgia, I, the, the, his play from the slot was awesome. Yeah. And in a the reason why I love him a lot for Tampa is because Christian Isian, their undrafted uh, rookie corner from last year, I think came on strong to earn the starting gig out of camp. And he had a, a good first couple of weeks in the season. And then, you know, it's sort of you know, regressed to the mean, if you will, where yeah. starting at slot corner as a rookie in the NFL is really, really difficult. But, you know, Izian has a little bit more quickness to him. He's a little bit smaller, whereas Tyke Smith gives you a little bit more power. So to me, I really like the combination and the um, just the versatility, the options that they now have at slot defender, especially with Jordan Whitehead now back at safety. So they have kind of that guaranteed one, two with Antoine Winfield Jr. and Jordan Whitehead at the safety spot. Now you kind of are free to use Christian Isian and use Tyke Smith how you want as a slot defender on this team week to week. You know, does the team primarily use big wide receivers or tight ends in the slot? Okay, I think Tyke Smith can handle those guys pretty well. Maybe not right away as a rookie, but, you know, theoretically, what he brings to the table from a skill set, skill set standpoint. You know, Christian, Christian Isian, I think he can match up a little bit more with those smaller, shiftier wide receiver types, if that is mainly what the team they're, you, they're going up against is using. So, to me, it's a really nice one-two combo now for for both of these guys. I, I love the strength that Tyke Smith kind of brings to the table, and I think an underrated part of playing slot corner is fitting the run. Not a lot of people think that. They think of, oh, you know, this corner is an outside corner in college football. Eh, he's not really big enough to be an outside corner at the NFL level. Let's just move him in the slot. If he can't tackle, he's not going to be a good slot. You're close to the line of scrimmage. You have to be able to fit the run, and I'm not worried about that with Tyke Smith like I would be for some other corner. So I do think he was a good addition for this team. I got to I gotta show you something here. You're going to like this. Okay. All right. Just a little uh, RAS comp for you there. Wow. 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 So what you're saying is Tyke Smith, future defensive player of the year candidate. Yes. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. I, I had this thought before I looked at their comp, by the way, just watching his tape. I was like, wow, that dude moves and plays just like Winfield when Winfield's in the slot. Yeah. Um, now, can he drop back and do the free safety stuff? I think that's the bigger question, but uh, we'll see. We will see. Hey, um, I love it. I love it. <laughs> all right. You want to do a little draft? Sure. Let's do it. Is it like offense and defense or what are we doing yep. here? How's so this how this is going to work is Baker Mayfield is both of our quarterbacks. Okay. And then we're just going to do a little snake draft. Um, and we'll let the comments decide who drafted the better team. Okay. From our bucks. Okay. So are we doing like seven on seven? We doing full 11 on 11. What are we doing? It'll here? we doing it'll, like it'll NFL be... street style where you got to play like <laughs> both ways or what are we doing? Picture um, the rest of the undrafted players will just be like NPC average, you know, <laughs> <laughs> basic. Okay. 75 overall okay across okay. the board so, players so how many guys are we drafting how many are we draft? let's do um let's let's want to do seven is that too much no it works for me let's, do, let's seven. do seven all, all right. right let's do seven okay um i'm gonna flip my raycon case heads or tails <laughs> uh heads raycon getting a, a free promo here getting the promo <laughs> here all right you won mm. you want first pick or uh, no, no, I want second and third. I want you to take. Yeah, first. that's probably the right call in this format. All right. Um, I mean, I I think I got to go Tristan Wirfs. I mean, okay. I just feel like number one, the drop off in talent on the O line after him is pretty major. So yeah. 
there's that. And the dude, I mean, he's a top three left tackle. He, he might get his big contract by the time this video goes live here. So yeah. I'll go worse. Number one. Yeah, that was, that was, that was the correct choice. If I had the number one pick, I was, I was going to go with Tristan works, but uh, having the number two and three pick here back to back. I'm obviously going Anton Winfield Jr. Yeah, obviously have to. have to, he has to be, he has to be one of those picks. And um, the second one's very tough, very tough. But I'm going with well, Vita. I don't want you to pick. I, I'm, <laughs> That's I'm who I was. He was the other guy I was thinking about at one because I was like, that gives you something you just right. And that's the, that's the play. thing is is I don't think people understand that you know we have a we have a wins above average metric at PFF, and you know people talk about like oh uh, like even right here we talked about like all replacement players things like that. I think Antoine Winfield Jr. himself was good for at least two and a half wins last year from for, for the Buccaneers. Like single-handedly. The, some of the tackles and the plays that he made, especially the at the end of the year, okay? Tampa has the opportunity to clinch the division and make the playoffs in week, uh, what was it, 17 versus the Saints. Yeah. They don't do it. They look bad. They don't do it. The Saints end up winning the game. Not a good situation. They could have like clinched it at home. Not great. But it's okay because now you go on the road at Carolina, and it's Carolina, right? They're the worst team in the NFL. If we don't get a superhuman play from Antoine Winfield Jr. to punch the ball out at the goal line to save Carolina from scoring a touchdown, Marcus, I don't know if they win that game. <laughs> I don't know if they win with everything on the line against the worst team in the NFL. I don't uh. know if they win that game without Antoine Winfield Jr. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, had to get had to get the, the hero of 2023 on here. I think he did it again too against the Falcons, didn't he? Yes, no, yeah, that was that was yeah. the first time that he did it when he punched it out against Desmond Ritter when Desmond was kind of uh I don't want to say lollygagging, but I think he, you know, like pulled up a little bit. Hey, could could Desmond get, Ritter in the red zone there. might be the worst quarterback <laughs> in the last decade. Um, all right, so now I get the snake. Yep. Um I'm going to take, oh, I man, think this is so much fun. This I know. So I love fun. this. I'm going to take Mike from you. You should. Cause I think you should. We both get, we both get Baker yep. in this situation. I think yep. their chemistry really came along with some of the back shoulders and stuff. Some of the yep. timing throws. Um, I like Godwin, but I think it's fall off after, after Mike to him. And then um, I'm going to go with because if i don't take this player i will have no pass rush i'm gonna take kalijah Kansi. yeah come on yeah damn it because i don't like anybody else on this d-line from a pass rushing perspective and you already got vita vea if we're going head to head i can't let you have both those guys so oh, i'm gonna take man. him oh man i would have gone can i think can gonna Good. have a monster year this year yeah. i think he's gonna be a stud He's going to be awesome. Um, well, back-to-back -back for me is pretty easy now. Um, I think there's very clearly two players that have to come off the list next. It's Chris Godwin and Levante David. So, Ooh, okay, that's not. Those are, those are the two I'm players. I'm happy with those picks. I think, uh, I, 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 think, I think Chris Godwin is still one of the better players wide receiver twos in the NFL. I just don't think that he gets the publicity for it for it. You know, he's, he's coming off the injury from a while ago. And I just think that like, since then, even honestly, like since the dirt cutter, Jameis Winston, we're going to force feed the ball to Chris Godwin years. Um, his stats haven't been as inflated as those seasons, but mm. I, he is still just such a phenomenal player for everything that he does over the middle as a deep threat after the catch as a blocker. Um, I think he's still one of the most underappreciated players in the game. And then Levante, man, just still got it. He has still got it, man. I mean, he is an ageless wonder. Uh, in my opinion, should be a Hall of Famer. I, I don't, I don't think that he has the national publicity to be able to get it. But his longevity, his success, his statistics, and truly what he has been for the Buccaneers since they drafted him has been. So, so, so impactful, and he just does not get the credit that he deserves. So I'm going the all underrated back-to-back -back here with Chris Godwin and Levante David. I, I think, I mean, 
with all due respect to those guys that had to retire early, like Bowman and Keekly, like you got to do what you got to do. But you look mm-hmm. at those guys being some of the best of the decade or the last two decades at this point. And then Bobby Wagner, great, but he's fallen off at age. Like who's been, I mean, he's got a very strong case. He's got yeah. a very strong. Tell case. him, tell him, Marcus, tell him about it. <laughs> tell him, I wasn't, I wasn't going to stop you. <laughs> You're like, come on, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, at one point, at one point, I gotta dig this back up, but God, this must have been like three years ago at this point. Keekley had retired, I think, either the year before. Wagner was obviously still in the league. And I did like a Google sheet side by side of like a bunch of statistics with those three guys. And not only was David close, like he beats out both yeah. of those players in multiple categories. And it's like he just does not have the national recognition. He wasn't this big first round pick. He wasn't this, you know, in the middle of the Legion of Boom defense. He what you know, like, I mean, like he, I'm not trying to take away anything from those other guys. It's just like David is right there over the last decade. There's no question about it for what he yeah. has been in the NFL. Yep. All right. The guy I thought you might take was Jamel Dean. I'm going to take him. Okay. I think he's phenomenal. He was really good down the stretch uh, for them last year. Um, Again, the fall off the corner after him is pretty steep. Strong. Um, And then, hmm. Mm, All right. Yeah. This is where I think there's one. I think there's an obvious pick here. I actually do. Not to put pressure. Now I'm like, I don't want to get this wrong. I don't want to judge me if I get it wrong. You can, it's fine, dude. It's your team. You're putting it together. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Obviously, Kate Otten. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Is it, is it Gotiki? Yeah. He's the obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's where I was leaning. So, well, I, I hate that I'm I, I bullied you, Trevor. You. I What'd you I'm say? Yeah. <laughs> I think my team's going to beat you. You have no O line. You have no corners. You got to defend Mike Evans. You got to try to block Kalijah. I mean, you're right. It might be the best uh, pass rusher on this team. That's, that's, that's tough. That's it's, uh, you know, like I said, Antoine Winfield Jr. is good enough for two and a half wins. So it doesn't really matter what you have to say. <laughs> um, okay. So my next two picks here. This game's going to come down to ball security on if we can defend a Antoine Winfield peanut punch. <laughs> <laughs> it actually, it actually is. Um, I'm going to go Yaya Diaby here. Okay. Diaby. I, I think the the sack number because I think he finished with six sacks last year. The sacks itself, I think, were a little overinflated. But like, I yeah. do think this guy's got potential. Like, I think the size, speed, explosiveness. Like, I, I think his his sack statistics last year were overinflated for how good he was on a play by play basis. But I actually mm-hmm. think this year he gets much closer to like legitimately being a good pass rusher for this team. So. I think we've got a pretty big year coming up for Diaby. So I'm going to go Diaby there. And then I think my next pick. I know who I don't want you to take. Who you don't want me to take? Yep. Yep. Let's see. <laughs> oh, man. That's now you're messing with me. Uh huh. Uh, Jordan Whitehead's got to be next for me. Oh, thank God. Whitehead's Whitehead's was awesome the last year that he He's played good. in Tampa. Yeah. Him and Winfield Jr. are an awesome duo as as a safety uh, backfield. But I just there's not really another player that uh, is screaming at me that I have to draft. I mean, you 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 you're saying that Tyke Smith is the next Antoine Winfield Jr. So maybe like that's the ace that's up in your sleeve here. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go with Diaby and I'm gonna go with uh, uh, Jordan White. All right. Well, I'm going to take Graham Barton. Okay. And I don't know who's blocking for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're about to take Ben Bredesen with your seventh pick. Look, you said you said the rest of them were just average, and Tampa's interior O line was worse than average last year. So technically, yeah. skipping on interior yep. offensive line is actually an upgrade. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have set the bar at 75 overall. Big brain, big brain, right <laughs> yeah. there. Yep, you did big brain that, I guess. Um, <laughs> there's a chance that your NPC center is better than Graham Barton. Um, but I will take him. And then just want to make sure I'm not forgetting anybody before I get a little spicy. Mm-hmm. I think with the same logic you just applied, any other D lineman 
are going to be about as good as I mean, yep. with all due respect to Joe Tryon, I just not a huge fan at this. You point. know, I mean, he has he he's had plenty of time to hit his stride and it feels yeah. like this is like I mean, it, it, it's timing up correctly with his contract because this is truly last year. Like if 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 he does not figure it out to be a starter this year it will not happen in tampa yeah change of scenery well, go somewhere else maybe it's somewhere to else. me that to me the fact that they turned down the opportunity to get him for a one-year 13 million dollar deal right on a fifth year option right. tells me like they don't even think he'll take another step because if if he just takes another step and he's like right. a decent number two that's a good value at that point and they don't mm -hmm. even seem to think he can do that um but i am i'm gonna take tyke smith i'm gonna do it i'm gonna believe in my guy i'm gonna i'm just gonna bank on like I don't know how much he'll play this year, but you know, maybe by the end of the 2025 season, we'll we'll look back and be like, Marcus definitely won that draft when we saw how good Tyke Smith was. I kind of want to take another receiver here, but which one for my last pick? Yeah. Because I mean, Sterling Shepard and Baker had an awesome connection when they were in Oklahoma. Hmm. I, I McMillan, I'm 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 high on McMillan, man. I think McMillan's okay. gonna be a stud for them. I think that's my last pick right there. Jalen McMillan. Okay. I'll take okay. Jalen McMillan as the final pick of this draft here. So both look at us. Both of us going rookies with our last pick. I guess you went rookie with your last two picks there. Wow. I look did. at you. Look yeah. at you, Jason. Hey, Less if I had bold with being a first round pick, though. If I if I had Less a bold. you know, if I if I had another pick, I'd pick Bucky Irving. So, you know. Ah, uh, yeah. You had to get that in. You yeah. had to get that in. Yeah. Awesome. All right, chat. Let us know whose team's gonna win head to head. Um Trevor, thank you. This was awesome. I know you and Connor are doing your uh, summer scouting, which is yes. always fun, uh, specifically this year because I've been using it to like determine who my uh, college football 25 team is going to be <laughs> when the which game is, comes out. Which, which, how beautiful is it that we get to say that now? Uh, you know, it's just, yes, it's, it's, it's a truly beautiful thing. Yeah, July 1st, it's coming out this month. But uh, anything else you want to say before we get out of here? No, man, I appreciate you having me on the show again. This is a lot of fun. Anytime, you know, as, as somebody who started his journalism career uh, in the Tampa market, now more of now covering it more from a national angle, mm -hmm. I don't get as many chances as I wish to really like focus in on the Bucks. And so this is always a lot of fun for me to go back and kind of do the research and to get the opinions on the team because I don't have as many excuses to do that. So always a fun time, my friend. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks again. So a huge thanks, as always, to Trevor for coming on. And a huge thanks to you guys for watching this you know, two plus hours into this video, you are the NFL diehards, or as they say on Trevor's podcast, the sickos, that's you guys. So thank you for being the best. Thank you for watching. Please do hit that like button on the way out. Um, really appreciate it. You guys are the best and we'll see you when uh, we see you for the next deep dive. We are um, kind of on the move here, um, moving out of the house, moving down to Charlotte. So it's going to be, difficult for me to work on these deep dives while we're doing that. I'm going to do my best. So no promises on when we get the next one, but once we're settled in Charlotte, it'll be pedal to the metal. It'll be like basically every other day for these deep dives, which is going to be crazy, but fun. Looking forward to it. Enough blabbering. Let's get out of here. We'll see you later.